Sun. Good afternoon, everyone. The December 8th, 2021 Governance and Education Committee special meeting will not come to order. It is 2.04 p.m. I'm Lorena Gonzalez, chair of the committee. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wise. Here. Councilmember Mosqueda. Councilmember Sawan. <clears throat> Councilmember Strauss. Present. Councilmember Mary Lewis. Present. Chair Gonzalez. Here. That's four present. Chair Gonzalez. Thank you so much. We do have quorum, so we'll go ahead and move to items of business here. If there's no objection, the agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. Uh, colleagues will now start public comment. Uh, while it does remain our strong intent to have public comment regularly included on future meeting agendas, the City Council reserves the right to end or eliminate these public comment periods at any point if we deem that the system is being abused or is no longer suitable for allowing our meetings to be conducted efficiently and effectively. I'll moderate uh, today's comment public comment period. Public comment period for this meeting is 20 minutes. Each speaker will have two minutes to speak. I'll call on each speaker um, in the order in which they registered on the council's website. If you've not yet registered to speak, but, but would like to, you can sign up before the end of public comment by going to our website. Uh, the link is also listed on today's agenda. Once I call your name, staff will unmute your microphone. You'll hear the automatic prompt if you have been unmuted, and then that'll be your cue to press star six before you begin speaking. Please begin by stating your name, the item that you are addressing, and remember public comment should relate to an item on today's agenda. During your public comment, you'll, you will hear a chime, and at that chime, uh, that chime is noticed that there is 10 seconds left of your two minutes provided. Please listen for that chime and make every effort to wrap up your comments. If you don't wrap up your comments at the end of your time allotted, your microphone will be muted to allow me to call on the next person. Once you've completed your public comment, please disconnect from the line and you can finish watching this committee meeting on Seattle channel or one of the listening options listed on the agenda. Public comment period is now open. And let me go to the Google Sheet here. That's the wrong device. All right, uh, we only have two public commenters signed up for public comment today. The first is David Haynes, and then the second is Heather Kelly. David, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. INF 1955. City Council should reject this racist anti white citizen policy known as the race and social justice lens, forcing government employees to discriminate, forsake, purposely hate, and judge based on innocent white citizens' skin color. It's already evident within Human Services Department prioritizing criminals into motel while redirecting money away from shelter for innocent homeless citizens, denied second winter of COVID, proving that city council sabotaged war on drugs, helping BIPOC criminals within just care who dare to prioritize, excuse me. Secondly, the resolution 32029 should be rejected out of principle. It's introduced after council lost election. Council wants to manipulate rules and introduce racist government policies, further undermining democracy and community. If, if city council staff doesn't like to work on weekends, nor have the best interests of community at heart, or the ability to stay sober on weekends, maybe they should find another line of work. Stop, stop trying to undermine our community. You're doing a disservice to real progress, introducing a racist lens of government skin color judgments and bad practices from the racist, scorned, woke vulture culture, browbeating and bullying and taking over the microphone, intimidating cowards on council, doing devil's bidding, creating racist, retaliatory government with untrustworthy employees. We need a law protecting the people's democracy and community at large from the false steeple and hypocritical creeper who think they're entitled to fill in the blanks of a negative past already overthrown except for their scorned lived experience who wants to retaliate and they should confront the individuals who scorn them instead of taking it out on the innocent community who suffer in your all's evil racist war lens policies. So reject these two resolutions and ideas from the racist miseducation side of hate and ignoble and great. Stop judging people in the skin color. Even Martin Luther King Jr. would be protesting you. He said, judge a person by their character and their qualifications, not their skin color retaliations. Sober up, folks. 
Next up is Heather Kelly. Heather, welcome. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Um, my name is Heather Kelly. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Seattle King County, and I live in Finney Ridge. Um, and I just want to call and say thank you so much for inviting the League to comment um, on Resolution 32029. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to review the rules governing our legislators, and um, we will be submitting comments um, by email, but I just also wanted to follow up on what Council Member Strauss said at the last meeting regarding um, legislation that is submitted without um, a sponsor identified. The League um, agrees with Council Member Strauss that although we know that the Council would impose um, that rule only in very limited requirements, additional language is needed to make sure that it is applied um, only very narrowly. Um, the League, as you know, is a proponent of open government, transparency, and accountability. Um, it's what we advocate for across King County, and so that's a really important component for us. Um, we also want to say thank you so much to the Council for every effort that you've made to keep meetings open and accessible and to provide written materials in advance, even during the pandemic. Um, we were able to relaunch a key program of the League of Women Voters called Observer Corps during the pandemic, um, where we were have we have volunteers attend public meetings and then provide reports. Um, we're currently between websites, but we'll be uploading those reports to our new website soon. Um, and we would love to continue having access virtually to meetings, so observers not only in King County but throughout the country can watch what's going on in Seattle as Seattle leads in so many important areas. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment and I will be in touch by email. Thank you, Heather, so much for calling in today and sending us your um, comments. Uh, just uh, confirming with our IT department that we have no other registrants in the waiting room. There are no further public comment registrants. Thank you so much. So that will conclude our public comment period and we will move to other items of business uh, on our agenda. We only have two items of business on today's agenda. The first will be a presentation from our Department of Human Resources on the Race and Social Justice Initiative. And then the second will be a consideration of resolution 32029 related to the general rules of the Seattle City Council that is slated for briefing discussion and a vote. So will the clerk please read item one into the record. And V, you are muted. Agenda item one, the Seattle Department of Human Resources, Race and Social Justice Initiative 2021 presentation for briefing and discussion. Great, and I do want to note for the record that we were joined by Councilmember Mosqueda at about 2.06 p.m. Thanks for being with us. Okay, so uh, we have the first agenda item as um, our clerk just read into the record. It's a presentation from the Seattle Department of Human Resources regarding the Race and Social Justice Initiative. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the good folks over at our Department of Human Resources to introduce themselves for the record and we will dig into the presentation. Who's going to kick us off first? Is that going to be you, Felicia? I will, yes, only because our director, Kimberly Loving, is here, but apparently wasn't able to put her name into the... Oh, no. So she's, I don't think she's able to talk. So she's on there as question mark, love, question mark. That is actually um, the director. Right. Um, great. Um, Son, can you please let her in? There we go. All right, we now have our interim director of uh, HR in here. Sorry about that, Director Loving. Uh, good to see you as always, and thanks for being with us. Yes, thank you so much, um, Council President. I apologize for my technological challenges. Thank you for getting me in. We are super excited. I am um, thrilled to be able to introduce 
um, some of our team that have uh, just worked really, really hard on the racial equity and social justice um, space and on this particular update. So of course you were speaking with um, our fearless director and leader of workforce equity in our department, Felicia Caldwell, who um, leads the team. And we have um, our current um, change team leads, Pam Donaldson and Vanessa Bloomsburg. So that is my role. I'm going to be quiet and let the um, smart people in this place um, be able to walk us through the, their accomplishments. Thank you. And we have a PowerPoint that V is going to share. Cue that up. There it goes. All right, we can see it. All right, thank you. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, thank you everybody. My name is Vanessa Bloomsburg. I'm one of the Change Team co-leads. And here's an overview of the topics we'll cover today. Uh, pretty much all of SHR's RSGI workforce focuses on workforce equity. Uh, this is because it's an internally focused department uh, and workforce equity is the area that SHR can have the most impact on. And this is something you'll see throughout the presentation today. Next, we're gonna give you an overview of the change team activities this year, as well as four of the racial equity toolkits that have been completed in SHR. Then we'll talk about our department's accomplishments outside of those items. We had a large number of successful projects this year and the whole list is in the presentation, but we're only going to have time to go into a few of them. Finally, we'll be talking about the ways in which the department fosters a spirit of racial equity and social justice by holding space for people's feelings. Uh, and next up, Pam will be talking about our first topic, the change team overview. Slide. Thank you, Vanessa. Hello, I'm Pam Donaldson, co-lead of the SHR change team. Throughout the past year, we've been through a great deal as a change team, department, and community, especially in how HR has been greatly impacted in supporting COVID-19 response and vaccination efforts while continuing to center equity efforts. During this season of shifting priorities, we've been working to transform the change team to best foster racial equity practices. As a change team, we've been able to do the following. Hold regular check-in meetings with SHR executives and establish a connection to the SHR budget process. Increase collaboration with Workforce Equity Unit and the RSJ Network. Increase change team equity education and have meaningful and tough conversations. Participate in the RSJ Key Leaders Program and use what was learned by the participants to recenter our group. Provide RET education and advising to the department, keep efforts moving forward despite being challenged by staff turnover. In this presentation, we will be touching on some of these areas more in depth as it connects with our greater collaboration with workforce equity. Next, my colleague Vanessa will discuss some of our racial equity toolkits in 2021. Slide, please. Now onto the racial equity toolkits. Uh, SHR's work is a little unusual in that we both work with inter on internal departments projects as well as projects that affect the whole city. Our SHR change team focused on, uh, focused on the department level uh, RETs while the larger whole city RETs for HR uh, leadership team projects were expected to include multiple departments. So today we'll be focusing on our department RETs uh, uh, though more work of course is happening in our, with our partner departments. Slide. All right, so first off is REACH. As you may know, REACH is a self-directed wellness program that the city provides that includes content like articles and videos uh, and, and other activities. The benefits team wanted to increase the amount of content aimed at BIPOC individuals, so they selected a number of videos on RSJI topics from the vendor. Um, through their RET, they discovered that the content was actually more appropriate for white people early on in their racial uh, equity journey. And per feedback from the advisor program, the benefits unit implemented the content, but included communication, acknowledging it wasn't for their original intended audience. Uh, the benefits unit just then engaged with their advisors for a part two uh, to work on tools that, uh, that would, would target their original intended audience. And that part is still in process. 
All right, second, uh, SHRs, uh, HR business partners who provide HR services for the small departments and offices decided to create a procedural manual for themselves and for other HR practitioners citywide. Through their RET, the change team provided feedback that the manuals needed to include information uh, on how the disparate impacts to BIPOC, uh, the, there would be disparate impacts to the BIPOC employees of not using these procedures. However, it was determined by the project team to not include the advisor's feedback due to where they were in the process. Uh, the next RET is something that uh, you, the city council members may be familiar with, um, the civil service exemption project. This project began when the class comp unit decided to create a request form for civil service exemption during the classification project. Uh, change team provided feedback that an equity lens really couldn't be satisfied on this topic by a form alone. And so class comp moved forward with creating another project team to create a more detailed guidance for the process that also engaged a change team advisor uh, to delve deeper into the questions presented during the initial RET. And that part of the project is still in process. Finally, there's a deferred comp website. Uh, due to their vendor implementing a new version of the Deferred Comp website, uh, Deferred Comp created a project to ensure the changes would not have disparate impact on marginalized populations. Uh, based on the um, sorry, equity review feedback received, um, they were able to uh, implement several different changes to the website, including adding closed captioning to videos, uh, working, making sure the website would work with screen readers. And uh, they're also in the process of ordering, of offering a full Spanish language translation of the website. All right, and now I'll turn it back over to Pam for uh, talking about the other things that we did with racial equity toolkits. That slide. After hearing uh, many concerns about our racial equity toolkit forms, the change team took on the process of redesigning them. Our goal was to make the form simpler, more user-friendly, and a guided experience that's more focused on a racial equity outcome, keeping in mind that many units within SHR don't deal directly with the public. We engage stakeholders by meeting with staff during multiple sessions to go over the revised form. We hosted targeted workshops facilitated in collaboration with workforce equity, learning and development and change team members to operationalize the forms and the new change team advisor program. Our goal was to implement a process for intentionally starting and working on a program policy or project from an equity centered perspective. Slide please. Our change team introduced the advisor program in the first quarter of 2021 and to date, we've advised on eight projects. The decision to create the advisor program was born out of a few factors we observed from past racial equity reviews. First, we had seen that the change team was not being engaged early enough in the process. For example, many individuals struggled with identifying a racial equity outcome. Second, project groups and our team saw the equity reviews as a burden to their process instead of a part of the process. Third, the timeliness of the change team feedback was negatively impacted. The advisor program allows at least two advisors from the change team to meet one-on-one -on -one with a project group to answer specific questions about completing an RET, defining an equity outcome, and check in if the project continues to move forward toward that goal. Advisors can also bring issues back to the entire change team to discuss them and make decisions with the change team. Using advisors from the change team has created a great avenue to engage the team on, a, on smaller projects that would not necessarily warrant an entire review by the whole team. The program has been very successfully combined with the RET training program and revised forms in having higher quality racial equity reviews that include racial equity outcomes. Additionally, this has led to earlier engagement with the change team where feedback is being implemented and used on projects. Now Felicia Caldwell will discuss other workforce equity strategies and accomplishments. Thank Slide. you. Thanks, Pam. So the workforce equity team was created in 2015 in response to executive order 201502 workforce equity initiative and council resolution 31588. 
However, workforce equity has always been a strategy for race and social justice. The team developed the first workforce equity strategic plan, which I'm sure Council President Gonzalez will remember very well, um, created that first plan with the definition that you see here in, in 2016. That plan included multiple strategies and is overseen by WEPAC, the Workforce Equity Planning and Advisory Committee, which is an IDT chaired by SLCR and SDHR directors. In addition, Executive Order 201804, Anti-Harassment, Anti-Discrimination, has continued to strengthen the need for workforce equity strategies. The IDT that created recommendations for change in this area included council members as well. Next slide. Since workforce equity connects to our larger RSJ work, we wanted to share with you some brief information about the strategic plan before moving into our accomplishments. So where are we? After five years, we know that generally females are underrepresented throughout the city, that as a city, our workforce is representative of BIPOC employees overall, but BIPOC employees are underrepresented at the top levels of supervisors and wage earners. Latinx are the most unrepresented group across the entire workforce. BIPOC women are most underrepresented at the top levels of pay and supervisory authority. Men of color continue to be overrepresented in discipline. And we had a very strange thing that has proven to be consistent, except for Asians, BIPOC employees are far less likely to get a performance rating of exceeds expectations. So what have we learned and what do we plan to do? We are definitely going to be more data driven. We have improved our data collection and, and are still doing so. We are employee driven. We are meeting with several employee engagement sessions and surveys and other ways to reach out to employees. We plan to concentrate on two to four major strategies instead of 12 or 15. Um, we hope to redefine workforce equity with more of an anti-racist lens. And finally, our goal is to submit to the new administration in the first quarter of next year, the new workforce equity workforce equity strategic plan for approval and adoption. Next slide, please. So what have we accomplished? This is just a sample. It's actually not our entire list. When I sent out the request for RSJ accomplishments, I got five pages from within our department. So we're really proud that we've been doing a lot of work, but we don't have time to share everything in depth. So we'll highlight a couple of areas. Next slide, please. So one of the things I want to highlight here is this A to, oh, sorry. So we sent, we have a different, we have some other accomplishments that aren't going to show here. So I want to apologize first up for that. Um, these are all accomplishments that are correct, but we wanted to add a couple more. One is that we have an A to Z investigations checklist that was created by the Human Resource Investigation Unit. And if you remember, that was one of the things that came out of the anti-harassment, anti-discrimination um, recommendations. And they've created a checklist that essentially went through a toolkit and the purpose was to increase consistency in citywide investigations and to include trauma-informed and emotionally literate techniques, um, as well as RET approved documents so that we can do a better job of having consistent investigations. Another thing that they were able to do, the same Human Resource Investigation Unit, is that they actually provide focused investigation training every month to HR employees who do investigations in their department, and these are all employee investigations. And this training was geared toward ensuring that employee voices aren't silenced and that the concerns are in fact elevated to HRIU. Um, and I'm not gonna read through all of these. I'm hoping that you can just read quickly kind of some of the things that we're working on with that. Next slide, please. More accomplishments. Um, I'd like to highlight a couple here. So when COVID hit, our supported employees 
were in danger of losing their jobs because there was no one in the office to supervise them in a lot of cases, or their jobs would have changed drastically during this time. But we were able to redesign every single supported employee job role to meet the changing work environment and to safeguard their jobs. Um, this was huge in that so many of the departments were basically saying, we don't think we'll be able to support them during this time. Another thing that I'd like to highlight is the police officer examinations. So we've added a section to the um, examinations for incoming or for um, first time police officers coming into the city. And this exam actually increases access to, to applicants and provides an equity lens on the exam. So what does that look like? It's now screening for bias and group think among other subjects. It's pretty new. We have not seen the um, how different it may we may end up with the groups of, of, of applicants, but it does seem to be increasing the percentage of people of color passing the exam. And then the last one I'd like to highlight is the city budget accountability. WEPAC has been partnering with race and social justice um, program and CBO in order to have a better equity lens on budget reports or budget requests, I should say. Next slide, please. Another thing I'd like to highlight is the lead leadership expectation and accountability plan assessment and tools. This came about because when we did the initial strategic plan, we went and talked to council members, mayor's office staff, department leaders, did a lot of interviews, and everyone agreed that leaders should be held accountable to RSJ. And most people agreed they didn't know how to make sure that happened. And so WEPAC took this on and actually created a tool that will help city leaders increase their knowledge of workforce equity and RSJI and develop skills to disrupt institutional racism. Next page, please. It has seven competency areas that are listed here, and every single one has great detail about what it takes to show up as an equitable leader. So the I don't know how to do this or what this would look like, um, is no longer an option if they have this tool available to them. Um, it, it gives you very, very detailed information in each of these places. Next slide. It includes a competency overview. That's where all the descriptions are. A self-assessment to find out where you are right now and an action planning workbook that includes how are you going to communicate back out to your department, how you're doing in this area. And then, of course, it includes lots of links and resources for the directors. And this is designed for essentially a director level position in the, in the, in the individual departments. We'd like to see this adopted citywide. There are a few departments that are using it right now, um, but it is definitely a tool that could be valuable to all leaders in the city. Next slide, please. So citywide, the HR leaders sponsor communities of HR practice. And, and so this is the HR leaders who are out in the departments. And the goal for these are to create accountability in the HR space to improve the work experiences of BIPOC employees, leading to excellent work experiences for all. And although these um, communities of practice are sponsored by the HR leaders, the work groups who are putting together programs and processes and recommendations for policies include HR and non-HR employees citywide. We figured we really can't, we can't judge ourselves. We need to know from our, our um, customers how we're doing. So those groups are meeting. Some of them are ending this year. They've, they've been going all year. Um, one of the things we're really looking forward to is to create this annual HR forum. But as you can imagine this year, it was kind of hard to get to that. Next slide, please. So one of the approaches that we're taking to do equity work in, in SHR and other places in the city is now this equity centered design. It is a practice of purposely involving minoritized communities throughout the design process with the goal of allowing their voices to directly affect 
how the so solution will address the inequity at hand. It's focused on oppressed groups that are the most impact, impacted by the project and really important, it includes redistribution of power and sharing creations, process, implementation, and evaluation. Next slide. Did the slide move and I didn't see it? Oh, now we lost it all together. <laughs> yeah, we might be having a little bit of um, technical. Okay. I think uh, I think V actually, our clerk got bumped. Um, okay. Never a good thing when you're sharing. When that's the person sharing the slide. Why don't you go ahead and Felicia? I'm, I know we all have access to yeah. uh, to to the slide, and, and and V will try to log back in. And I only have a couple more slides anyway, so I think I can go through them without you having to read anything for these. So another approach that we're taking is using relational culture. And these are practices that are essential to interrupting the many overlapping aspects of white supremacy culture in ways that allow us to be honest about truths, tension, conflict, disconnection, pain, possibility, care, and change so that we can all act together. The SOCR RSJ team has developed a handout that explains the practices necessary to operate in this way. And we have links to a lot of this that we've made available to you. So that is also one of them that you will have. And finally, I wanna talk just really quickly or almost finally about challenges. So what challenges have we had in 2021? Um, when we did this list of challenges, we figured out that many of these are experienced by, but not exclusive to Seattle Human Resources. Um, key leadership and staff turnover, it's been so much staff turnover and leadership turnover. Mm -hmm. Increased demands with COVID-19 response, as you can imagine, many of our team has had to jump on that um, all year. The whole sense of urgency, some of it brought about by COVID, but some of it just normal. Um, acknowledgement of issues, but lack of commitment to change. So this is when we are actually able to do things like racial equity toolkits and we get back, I don't have time, it's too hard, we're too far in the process, et cetera, et cetera. So they know the issues exist, but the commitment to change isn't there. We've also been greatly impacted by OCR, RSJI staffing and capacity because we work so closely with them on everything that we do. Um, we're all impacted by outdated systems and infrastructure. Uh, that's just a given at this point. But I also wanna point out that there is always an additional tax or impact for people doing racial equity work who are BIPOC, especially mm -hmm. for BIPOC women and BIPOC trans and gender non-conforming groups. Often these roles in this work is underfunded and not prioritized in the budget and even when it is, the emotional tax still exists. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about workplace spirit of racial equity and social justice. We were asked, how do we create space for people to share their reflections, their anger, their fear, their joy, those kinds of things. Um, we've done it in some ways by responding to employee needs that were brought to us throughout the year. Supervisors would say, what does it look like to be a good supervisor in this space? And so we created supervisor spotlight videos where supervisors were nominated by other people in the city um, as doing really well in one area or another. And we created these videos that can be used in learning and development or just to, to view to see how people are doing. We've had meditations in a burning house. I thought that was the most interesting title a three-part workshop for women of color that was essentially teaching self-care. What do you do to, to make sure you're okay? And we've also held trauma and resilience workshops for employees in the city. We've had a great increase in the um, SDHR teams and change teams having regular RSJ discussions. We adopted this race, relational culture movement. Um, and we just want to note that despite the experiences of loss and trauma and fear that have been happening due to the continued pandemic and racist hate crimes still happening in the world, um, people have been committed and they continue to do this work. They continue to be 
really devoted to making a difference. It's been difficult for so many of our employees and we are doing all that we can to provide them with culturally appropriate resources. And that's our presentation. Any questions for us? Great, thank you so much to the entire team over at um, Human Resources. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know there was a lot more you could share with us, which is um, always a good thing. Um, and I'm sorry that we don't have more time um, to hear about all of those other uh, pages worth of things that folks have been working on. I do wanna provide my colleagues an opportunity to ask any questions or make general remarks about uh, the very rich information that you all have presented. Any comments or questions, colleagues? Councilmember Mosqueda, please. Uh, I just want to say thank you for your presentation and for all the work that you've done. Um, in addition to what the council president just noted, how much we appreciate your work. And I think Felicia, as you noted in your conclusion comments, um, this has been such a hard two years and there has been so much turnover. And so in addition to the hard year, in addition to the fatigue that workers face, everybody really looks to HR to help process that. And so that's additional stress on all of you. So thanks for all the work that you've done and for the, the important work here with the RSJI um, change team. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you, Councilmember Mosqueda. Any other of our comments or questions? Okay, well, I also want to express my gratitude. Um, uh, you know, Felicia, you and I started working on these issues uh, way, way back when, I think as early as 2016, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really um, excited about a lot of the progress that you have presented through today's presentation together with members of the change team um, that have really advanced this work. Obviously, much more work is needed. Um, there's a lot more opportunities to make sure that we're investing in the health and wellness and um, ability of our um, employees to, to thrive um, and to feel um, like they belong to this city family. And I really am deeply grateful to you and to Vanessa and to Pam and to Director Loving for all of the um, uh, care and attention that you are lending to this really important um, issue um, related to our workforce, which is sort of, you know, where 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 things come to roost in terms of the race and social justice equity um, commitments for um, for um, SDHR. So really appreciate everything that you've done and um, and hope that you can continue to to make much progress and advancement on behalf of um, our workers who are also our residents and who also serve our residents. So much appreciation uh, to all of you. Thanks so much for, for being with us. Thank you for allowing us to present. Of course, Director Loving, anything you'd like to say? Thanks. No, I'm just, thank you. It's the team, you know, I stand behind the team. So thank you for having us. Um, we're really proud and we have a lot of work to do still. Lots of work, it never ends. Uh, much gratitude to you all. Uh, it is not go beyond me that uh, all of the folks uh, representing today, um, I think identify as um, as women and most of you are women of color. And so much uh, much thanks and appreci appreciation to all of you for the um, extra extra burden that you all have to carry in terms of, um, of moving this work forward. So thanks so much for your time and I wish you uh, happy holidays with um, with your family. Thank you. All right, be well all. We're gonna move to our next agenda item. Our, uh, apparently I am being told that there are some Wi-Fi connectivity issues over at City Hall, which is where um, the Nguyen, my clerk is at. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, step into also um, uh, clerking my own uh, meeting here. So. I'm going to go ahead and read the second item into the record. Agenda item number two, resolution 32029, a resolution adopting general rules of the Seattle City Council, superseding resolution 31920 for briefing, discussion, and possible vote. We do have several presenters with us this afternoon from uh, Council Central staff and from the City Clerk's Office. So I'm going to go ahead and 
uh, recognize folks to introduce themselves for the record, and then we will dig into the presentation. We do have, I think at last count, about 15 uh, amendments to get through, and we are scheduled to go until four o'clock. So my hope is that we're able to get through all of the amendments that we take a vote on each of the amendments, assuming that um, amendments receive a second, um, and uh, that we're able to ultimately vote on a resolution as amended for consideration by the city council on Monday, December 13th, which is this Monday. So um, so my hope is we'll, we'll be able to get through all of this um, uh, content uh, today as efficiently and effectively as we can to have as clean uh, of a bill with committee recommendation for Monday. So that being said, I'm gonna start uh, with introductions. I'm gonna hand it over to city clerk, Monica Martinez Simmons to introduce herself. And then uh, Monica, if you can hand it over to the next person, that'd be great. Absolutely, thank you, council president and good afternoon, council members. Um, joining me today are representatives of the council rules review working group, council central staff director, Esther Handy, uh, Deputy Director Dan Eater, and Office of the City Clerk, Deputy Director Elizabeth Adkison. Uh, Council members, since your last committee meeting on December 1st, the full working group has met to develop amendments brought forward by individual council members. Both Esther and Dan will run through the proposed language for each amendment for your consideration one at a time. Please also note that the written public comment period for the proposed rules resolution remains open through and including December 11th. There will also be a public comment opportunity on this item during the December 13th city council meeting. And Elizabeth, can you please confirm that all written public comment received to date has been distributed to all council members? Afternoon, yes, I can confirm that any written public comment that has been received thus far has been distributed and we are still watching for those coming in and we'll send them your way as they arrive. Thank you. And at this time, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Esther Handy and she will be followed by Dan Eater. Thank you. Thank you so much. Director Handy, welcome. Great, thank you, Esther Handy, Director of Council Central Staff. Um, at this time, we'd like to uh, walk you through the 15 amendments um, that have been proposed today. Um, as a reminder, the underlying resolution itself had um, 14 amendments, I believe, um, to the council rules and the ones we're gonna discuss are um, in addition to that. Um, I will invite V if um, she has connectivity to share those on screen, and if not, I can do so. She, she is back in action, so she is able to share a screen and Great. we will wait for her to do so. There we go. We have it up on the screen. Take it away, Director Handy. Great. And so and, and just and just what? before, um, so really quickly here, what we're going to do, because I want to make sure that we're um, we're all on the same page about what's going to happen here, because each one of these are um, amendments. So what we will do is have um, uh, you present on an item and then um, and then I think probably because there's so many of them, the best uh, process, I think, is to take them one by one. Um, um, otherwise, we will have forgotten by the time we get to number 15 <laughs> what number one was. So um, for council members who are off um, camera, just be aware that we will take each amendment one by one. We will hear a presentation on said amendment uh, from Director Handy and other Council Central staff members. And, um, and then we will um, we will uh, make motions to allow for us to have debate discussion about an amendment, and then we will vote on the amendment um, individually. So just uh, realized I had forgot, forgotten to lay that out. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Director Handy to kick us off with amendment one. Great, that sounds good. And I will um, I will do the brief description on the amendments. Um, Deputy Director Dan Eater has um, authored these amendments and can answer lots of technical questions about them and um, the city clerks as well um, as we get into discussion. So amendment one, um, and we feel free to move to that page, um, is authored by council member Peterson. Um, this amendment would eliminate the alternate positions on committees. The current rules state that standing committees will have at least four members and an alternate. 
The alternate is notified when a committee member is unable to attend and participates as a voting member of that committee during their absence. The resolution um, 32029 as drafted makes a change to this section saying that standing committees will have at least four members and may have an alternate. So it makes the alternate permissive. This amendment would eliminate all references to alternates in the council rules. Great. Um, so colleagues, again, as a reminder, we are on screen is over trying to take over my computer here. Okay, so we are on amendment one, again, for um, colleagues um, in the committee meeting, we are on amendment one. Um, this amendment is a spot is authored by council member Peterson as um, agreed through this process, I agreed to sponsor those um, amendments. Um, for non-committee members to allow for discussion in today's um, committee hearing. So I am going to move to amend uh, resolution 32029 as presented on amendment one on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, the amendment has been moved and seconded to adopt amendment one as presented on the agenda. Councilmember Peterson, um, as a non-committee member, but as a sponsor of this amendment, I'm gonna go ahead and recognize you to um, address the amendment, and then we will open it up for comments, uh, questions, and debates. Thank you, Council President and Chair. I appreciate this. Uh, I, wanna, I, I wanna thank the working group, the internal working group that met several times to consider updates to these rules and um, clerk's office, council central staff, city attorney's office, council president's office. And thank you, Council President Gonzalez for uh, enabling this space and time for everybody to participate, even if we're not members of the, the government committee. And even for, you know, putting your name on certain things that you might not be voting for today, but just to move the process along, really appreciate that, that grace and that leadership. And so this one is um, eliminating the alternate position. I think it, they, it made sense uh, last couple of years to institute that as we had set a really firm uh, membership of committees to satisfy, to be at a very safe harbor with the Open Public Meetings Act and to not have sort of roving uh, attendance at committee meetings. and and having an alternate there as sort of a backstop as needed. The way I've seen it unfold the last couple of years just in practice is that alternates don't often, some of the items on the committee are very meaty and they may not get, you know, three days seems like a reasonable amount of time and sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. So we're not always getting uh, sufficient notice to sort of read, um, to, to read everything and come up as prepared as the regular members uh, because of, of when we're notified. Um, the general public doesn't differentiate between an alternate and I've tried to explain that a couple of times. Well, I'm just an alternate on this. But when, you know, when the, um, the voting's happening and you see the photos of all the members there, the alternates included, it looks like we're, we're missing um, or we're not, we're not as prepared. And so, you know, the quorum requirement is three members out of five. I, you know, and having an alternate that makes an additional member, I, to me, it's sufficient that we have five members. Um, if one of them is absent, it's okay. You still have the four members. You still have enough uh, council members uh, exceeding a quorum uh, to have a robust debate at committee. It's okay if sometimes there's a two to two tie, things can still be pulled forward to the full council. So uh, I do appreciate the working group uh, making the change to uh, have it a uh, the alternate be discretionary uh, as committees are formed for the next two years. Uh, I think for simplicity, um, it would be great to just um, eliminate the position, which is what this amendment is. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Councilmember Peterson. Are there um, any comments or questions um, from colleagues or additional information um, to provide from Council Central staff? Okay, I see Councilmember Herbold's hand is up, so I'll recognize Councilmember Herbold. Any others who would like to get in the queue, please um, please do let me know by raising your hand. Thank you, uh, Council President Gonzalez, uh, and thank you um, as well for um, including non-committee members in this discussion. It's very, very appreciated. Um, 
I, I think I can think of one possible unintended consequence um, of uh, this amendment, um, and I don't want to I don't want to inflate the likelihood <laughs> of this unintended consequence. But I also want to ask uh, central staff if there are others. I can think of like, for instance, somebody might have a committee member, a regular committee member, might have um, a planned absence. Um, that's that's scheduled and everybody knows in advance, but uh, and that's say that's the that's um, the fifth commit uh, committee member, um, and um, or that's let's say it's the fourth. Well, I guess maybe that isn't a problem if there's a committee of five. I'm worried about a planned absence and then a sickness um, that is unplanned Great. and um, how that might impact um, the ability to meet meet quorum but um and and again i i don't know that that would that would happen that often um and with a committee of a five you would still even under that circumstance have the quorum of three um but i'm just wondering you know given that the the work group um made a recommendation of um uh allowing the uh the existence of an alternate to be permissive based on a committee chair's preference, uh, what, what other considerations they uh, might have had um, that led them to the proposal that's in the uh, the base bill as opposed to um, Councilmember Peterson's uh, preference as expressed in this amendment. Thanks. Go ahead, Director Handy. Great, I'm happy to... Um... Uh, respond to that and invite the office of the city clerk to add in if there's anything else um the we did have a discussion about you know the current practice is that there are five members on standing committees <laughs> and that provides an ability for two to be absent before you impact a quorum of three the rules themselves state that committees shall have at least four and um, uh, the intention of the working group was that there would be flexibility um, provided to the council president and the council when establishing committees, that if they were going to establish some committees um, that were smaller, um, that include four, you may want to include an alternate on those committees, um, such that if one person was absent, you would have quorum, but if two, two council members were absent, you would not. Um, and so we, are thinking, I don't think we have a lot of more specific scenarios that we sort of worked through, um, but we thought that that making it permissive would relieve the burden of always having alternates for council for large committees, um, but create the flexibility for the council as they create new structures. So would the sponsor of this amendment uh, be amenable to uh, including language that uh, limits the elimination of alternates to those committees that have five members because uh, I, I director handy i think your description of uh, a four-member committee is exactly what i was, <laughs> was thinking of with a planned absence um it's on the books um but then somebody is out sick unexpectedly and in, in you have to cancel that meeting if you can't if you can't get that um that alternate there Chair Gonzalez, oh, yeah, I? go ahead, Councilmember Peterson. Thank you. Yes, I in this uh, I was imagining a five-member committee um, in for this amendment. So um, I, I'd be very open to that if the, if there was a four-member committee. Okay. Um, I I uh, also want to acknowledge that the context in which we're talking about right now assumes um, absence in its entirety from a committee meeting. There are instances in which council members are simply late or tardy. Um, and in those instances, there is impact as well. Um, you know, it is not uncommon um, for me as the council president to receive several notices a week about needing to leave early about needing to arrive up to 30 minutes late um, or, you know, or only being able to attend sort of X, you know, from XYZ time to XYZ time. And again, uh, when you're dealing with those razor thin margins, um, that, that, that does call into question 
about um, you know whether you start with quorum and then lose quorum throughout the meeting. Um, you know, the, I think um, there are um, questions that arise about whether any action taken during the period of time in which you do not have quorum is um, is um, compliant with um, the rules and um, and can you know continue to move through the legislative process. So I just want to be. Um, I just want to be mindful of of that, and so I don't think that the because I'm concerned about sort of those um, those instances that I've just described, those scenarios I've just described. I'm not sure that the revision being proposed by Councilmember Herbold to Councilmember Peterson's amendment solves for the issue entirely, um, and and it is part of the reason why I was leaning towards supporting the recommendation from the work um, group, which was to allow the president uh, to have the discretion about whether or not to have an alternate based on the committee composition, including um, who the council members are and the number of council members serving on each committee. And so I, um, I, would, I would encourage us to, to allow for that discretion to be exercised by the council president in um in uh you know sort of the next iteration of committee meeting structures um as opposed to being more prescriptive um in this instance um you know frankly i'm not sure there's going to be any committees of only four members i, I suppose that's possible but um but but i do think that that um even in the instance of four committee members that that the the proposal included in the base resolution would allow for the council president to either choose to or choose not to assign an alternate based on the composition and the size of of the committee are there any other comments or questions Councilmember Mosqueda go ahead I'm sorry council president I'm not sure where the best place to insert this is but um uh, just for food for thought, I, I think four members of a committee is, is not bueno idea. Um, I think that would constantly lead to having a tie. So would uh, be interested in this amendment, um, assuming that we keep uh, five members of the committee, five members on a committee um, and uh, look forward to hearing more about this. Yeah. Um... I do want to sort of uh, go back to sort of the discussion around having five members in the first place. The whole point was to make sure that there were was an actual recommendation that would come out of um, our committees um, so that the full council and the non committee members would have the benefit of an actual committee recommendation. Um, I will say that in the last year, we have seen some instances in which there is a um, you know, for a, a two, two, um, you know, divided folks on the committee. And in those instances, it has been, um, a struggle to, <laughs> um, for non-committee members to, to sort of catch up and figure out why, why there is so, so much, um, division amongst, amongst the committee. And so, um, um, you know, sort of just thinking through the number of uh, members on a committee was sort of really rooted in wanting to have uh, an opportunity for a majority of the city council to signal to the full council its support or lack of support for a particular legislative um, proposal, whether it was a resolution or an ordinance. Councilmember Strauss. Thank you, Council President, uh, and thank you, Councilmember Peterson, uh, for bringing this forward. Just signaling my support for this amendment if we have five members on the committee. Short and sweet. Thanks, Council President. Okay, Director Handy, you did have your hand raised. Would you? Um, did you still want to add something? Sure. I just wanted to clarify that the um, one of the changes underlined in this resolution um, says that a committee member must be absent from an entire meeting for the alternate to attend and have full, full voting rights. So an, an alternate could still sit in and participate in discussion. Um, but that is one related change, um, that is an underlying resolution. Yeah. And I, and I, uh, thank you, director handy for um, bringing that up. I think that the, the, the issue where this comes up, you know, to head is around sort of whether you can start a committee meeting, um, uh, or whether any, or whether if you lose quorum, 
there, um, there are implications to um, compliance with the rules in terms of the actions that you are taking. So, um, yeah. Are there any other comments or questions? Councilmember Mosqueda, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Council President, and I look I look to you to provide some intel on this as well, having helped to craft the um, initial composition of a five member committee. Um, if we are, if our hope is to have a five member committee, um, but there's the chance that someone is potentially sick or on leave, um, then I think we run the risk of if one person is sick, ending up with a, a four person committee and then potentially a two two vote. So as much as I want to keep a five member committee and I'm also, you know, not wedded to having having to have alternate alternates um, and appreciated the, 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 I think the rationale for the amendment to begin with. Now I'm a little bit torn because I do want to make sure that we're not ending up with a divided vote as much as possible. I'm not sure if other folks have thoughts about that, but um, I had very much um, appreciated where the sponsor was coming from and also really interested in keeping uh, the ability to have five people there. And if that requires us to have an alternate, then I'd be interested in hearing what other folks are, what other folks thoughts are on that because I can see the benefit of keeping that alternate if that's our ultimate goal. Councilmember Strauss, please. Uh, just signaling that I think Councilmember Herbold and Councilmember Mosqueda's points are now re resonating with me about this extended leave. Um, just sharing. That's about it. Okay. Um, so, so colleagues, I think I think um, there are a couple of options here. Um, the first option is to accept the amendment as presented. Um, which would entirely eliminate an alternate regardless of the number of members on a committee. Option two is to make an amendment uh, to amendment one that would um, require that the, the elimination of an alternate uh, would only apply to committees of five council members opening up the question of, I suppose that insinuates that there might be committees of less than five members. <laughs> um, and option, um, and then option uh, three, well, I guess there isn't an option three. Th those are the two options. <laughs> so we have option one, vote on amendment one as written, which is a complete elimination of alternates regardless of the size of the committee and option two requiring that the elimination of alternates is only applicable to committees of five. Councilmember Mosqueda. Thank you very much. Um, given that we are on amendment one of many amendments, I'll just uh, go ahead and suggest Councilmember Peterson. Uh, I was intending to want to support this. I absolutely agree that you don't want people coming in necessarily who haven't been following and given the, how much our staff has already stretched thin on the multiple issues that council takes on. I see the value of that. I think at this point, Councilmember, just to let you know where I'm going to be, I, I think I will probably be a no on this amendment because I'd still like to make sure that there are five people. Um, and if that fifth person needs to be an alternate to avoid having a divided vote. I'm going to go ahead and vote no on this amendment, but appreciate um, that there's clearly some work to be done and either in terms of additional ways that we can support those alternates or um, helping to make sure that they're not coming in and out at various points. But uh, it sounds like that's in part, in part addressed um, already in the underlying. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, Okay, and just as a reminder, the uh, only other voting council members on the line today are Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Strauss, and Councilmember Juarez. Um, Councilmember Peterson and Herbold are our esteemed guests for um, for the afternoon. So, are there any other comments or questions on this one? Councilmember Strauss, please. Thanks. Just signaling the same thing that Councilmember Mosqueda said coming into this meeting. I was uh, going to support this amendment, and unfortunately, I will not be today. Okay. I appreciate that. 
I do think that there is a choice here about um, potentially having divided votes um, repeatedly uh, and or, you know, managing public expectations uh, and staff time around um, being um, deployed as an alternate. Um, those are two real concerns. And I wonder if between now um, and um, Monday, I can have conversations with the work group about um, any potential language or opportunities to consider that would um, require perhaps more advance notice on um, on the need for an alternate if an alternate is um, is in is in place. I'm not sure we can we can get there, um, but um, but I, I sort of really am, am am hearing that the issue really here is much more about notice. Uh, um, than anything than anything else, and so um, am sensitive to to that to that need, and we'll continue to have conversations with Councilmember Peterson and others to see if um, uh, something related to notice in in non emergent situations may be um, the better the better path here um, to allow for a little bit more certainty and predictability for alternates. Okay, colleagues, um, I'm going to go ahead and call this to a vote because we have uh, had a conversation about it for uh, some time. Um, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 1? Councilmember Warris? Yes. Lewis? No. Mosqueda? No. Strauss? No. Chair Gonzalez? No. That's one in favor, four opposed. Thank you so much. The motion fails. The amendment is not adopted. Uh, and uh, the bill is still before the council. We are going to move to amendment two. Council, uh, Director Handy, please. Eight. Amendment two is also authored by council member Peterson. Um, we all invite you to um, scroll to the next page. Um, Amendment two would revise the rules to allow council members to abstain on resolutions at full council, except for those resolutions that are coming from the select budget committee. Um, under the current rules, abstentions are not permitted on council bills or resolutions at full council. Um, this expands where abstentions are allowed. Great, thank you so much, Director Handy. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move this um, amendment again. Uh, Councilmember Peterson is the author of uh, Amendment 2, and I am the sponsor of Amendment 2. So uh, I'm going to move to amend Resolution 32029 as presented on Amendment 2 on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you so much, Councilmember Juarez. Really appreciate it. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to adopt Amendment 2 as presented on the agenda. I'm going to hand it back over to Councilmember Peterson to um, address the amendment as the author of said amendment. Thank you, Council President. Colleagues, I've advocated for this option previously. Um, I think the past two years have reinforced uh, rationale to have this as an option to abstain, not on ordinances or budgets, but on resolutions. And this amendment brings our rules more in line with Robert's rules of order where abstentions are allowed at all meetings. Um, abstentions are allowed by other Washington cities such as Tacoma, Renton, and Yakima. And while one may argue that you know, we are elected officials, we're here to make decisions, abstaining is not really a decision. Yes, and we were elected to make decisions on ordinances and budgets and, and city government issues and but resolutions can sometimes stray from the city charter obligations and we uh, the time that we and our teams and our central staff expend crafting researching debating many resolutions um, they um, it's time spent away from other ordinances and, and budget matters and so the ability to abstain uh, still enables any resolution to come forward it's just um, gives an option to to the independently elected officials to to abstain. So um, I think that, um, you know, for those who don't like the idea of abstentions, they don't have to abstain. Um, you know, that's the that's the responsibility and choice of the independently elected official to abstain according to Robert's rules of order and um, think that this would this would help um, with uh, with productivity. If we have this option. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much, Councilmember Peterson. Are there any comments or questions on Amendment 2? I'm just gonna scroll through here. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands um, raised. Um, Councilmember Peterson, I have um, generally taken the position um, that you described in your remarks, which is I, I do think uh, uh, resolutions in my mind are sort of statements of uh, intent and policy um, and have generally been loath to support the position of allowing council members to abstain during um, full council. Um, and I appreciate that your amendment has um, gotten nuanced since you and I first talked about um, uh, this potential proposal and that you're now uh, 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 proposing to allow for abstentions only in those uh, instances in which there aren't um, fiscal impacts. Um, I, I did want to ask Council staff one um, technical question, which is that the amendment refers specifically to resolutions that come to the Council with recommendations from the Select Budget Committee. Um, and there are other amendments in the uh, resolution attachment that make uh, a Finance Committee a standing committee. Um, and so I'm a little uh, worried that um, because now it's very, very narrow to the Select Budget Committee that there might be resolutions that come from uh, the Finance-Related Committee on Finance-Related Issues uh, um, that uh, would not fall under the umbrella of this particular amendment and council rule if amended. So can you, can you just walk us through um, uh, other aspects of the council rule related to um, uh, to, to, to the sort of um, how finance committee issues are, are are dealt with in terms of the structure of the city council. Sure, I'm happy to start and pass it to you, Dan. Um, we certainly had discussion about um, how to capture the idea of non-budget resolutions um, into technical language. Um, and um, recognize budget related work happens both in the finance committee and the select budget committee. I think our sense is that the bulk of the um, resolutions come out of the select budget committee when you are setting the budget for the next year. Um, uh, language certainly could be expanded to include the finance committee um, if, if there was a sense that we were going to miss a significant um, body of resolutions there. Dan, do you wanna weigh in with any more detail on that thinking? I was going to cover the same ground. I, I don't have anything to add. Yeah, I think on the on the finance committee, and now I acknowledge that, that our finance committee is oftentimes coupled with other issues, um, right? Whether it's you know housing or labor standard issues or, or other kinds of um, issues, and so I don't intend to sort of make all of those things um, part part of part of um, this discussion. But I but I I, I um, I would hate for there to be the unintended consequence of resolutions related to the budget, say, for example, supplementary budgets um, uh, to not, uh, you know, to be included in sort of this, you can abstain on those resolutions, um, I think would be um, inappropriate. So, so I'm interested in um, I have softened my position. Congratulations, Councilmember Peterson. I've softened my position on this issue, <laughs> and, um, um, and but but do think that it would be wise to to try to um, capture those resolutions that may come um, from budget ordinances uh, through um, through a non-select budget committee process um, and 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 so would like to sort of think through um, how to better capture that intent um, so that it's not entirely limited to budget related legislation through budget process yeah and I think I'll add I think it would probably um, take a little bit more work on our behalf this week to be workshopping with you all to um, figure out how to define that budget aspect um, so you could either, you know, 
um, support this and then we could try to bring a technical amendment that um, further narrows or you could hold this and we could bring a version of it that um, makes some of those changes um, for Monday. Great, great. Uh, Councilmember Strauss, your hand is raised, please. Uh, thank you, Council President, and thank you, Councilmember Peterson, another good intention here, which I want to support. I do understand that there is a fair amount of city business that is contained within resolutions that come from committee. And so uh, I'd propose a friendly amendment if possible, that the exception for, so it would be, however, council members would not be allowed to abstain from council votes on resolutions that refer to city business. So if a resolution is before us that is regarding something that is not germane to our daily duties in city business, that an abstention is allowed. However, if the resolution is regarding city business, then it, uh, an abstention would not be allowed. Just Sharon. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Councilmember Strauss. I think that's kind of getting to the heart of what I was trying to articulate, um, although I was trying to keep it just to the finance aspect, since that's what Councilmember um, Peterson was proposing in his base amendment. Um, uh, I, I will um, uh, call on Councilmember Peterson in a minute. I want I want to give you, Councilmember Peterson, the benefit of, of hearing um, more Councilmember reactions, and then um, and then uh, certainly want to invite you into the invite you into the dialogue once once you have the benefit of hearing some more thinking here. Councilmember Herbold, please. Thank you so much. I just want to say that I uh, would like to take this opportunity as a non-voting member of this committee to um, echo the um, feedback that uh, we just heard from Councilmember Strauss. Uh, uh, resolutions that uh, pertained to, pertain to city business that are um, uh, uh, you know, focused on um, the, the council's position on, on items that are assigned to our committee, I think are really, it, they are still very important to um, to know where individual council members stand um, on those, so uh, I, I I think I understand what uh, council the council member Peterson is 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 trying to um, create some some discretion on the on the ability to um, to not vote on um, resolutions that are unrelated to city business, and I and I support that. Um, but um, don't want to cast the net too wide with that discretion. Thank you. Great. Um, Dan, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I was going to, uh, picking up on uh, Council Member Herbold's point, um, when we are workshopping, uh, if, if this gets um, uh, put in, uh, request for staff to work with interested uh, parties on a proposal. I think it might be a good idea to make uh, there be some decider about which resolutions fall into the camp of being um, acceptable for abstentions because they relate to city business or to meet some other objective criteria. Um, that could be a discretionary call that's made by the council president at the time of uh, introduction referral or at some later date. But I do think that you know there, there would need to be some decider of uh, whether a resolution meets the criteria or doesn't in order to um, set the stage for uh, for votes at full council. Dan, you are reading my mind. We have worked together for um, for too long, or just enough, apparently. Um, I was thinking the same thing. Um, the the phrase "city business" is. Um, is uh, in the eye of the beholder in terms of how to define it. And so um, I do think that somebody would need to make the call um, about whether or not uh, the item was related to city business that would not prevent the resolution from being introduced um, on the referral calendar. It would just simply trigger this particular provision of the council rule to allow uh, individual council members to exercise their discretion by um, either voting for, against, or abstaining on that um, resolution. Um, so I, um, I um, am going to suggest uh, that, well, first of all, before I make suggestions, I do, I did promise Councilmember Peterson an opportunity to um, engage in the conversation, so I will fulfill my commitment and call on Councilmember Peterson. 
Thank you, Council President. Yes, I the the intent of city business or not, that was actually you know thought of, and then we ran into the same problem of well, how do we decide that? That puts a big burden on the council president, and then there's an argument about what's city business or not. Like the sponsor, I think it is, and the council president doesn't, and. And so that's how we narrowed it down to the budget. I would be very open to budget committee and finance committee. Um, and, and we could try it out and see how it goes because, um, you know, these, these rules are an art and we're, we put them in practice and see how it goes. And again, this is, the abstention is really on the council member who's abstaining. So if somebody's upset, like, hey, they should be making a decision. I mean, we have to answer to our constituents. So. And it's Robert's rules of order, so I feel like, why should why should each independently elected official be required to then research international law that has some you know small nexus to the city um, business? I just I, that's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm trying to solve for. So it's to not burden nine council staffs and central staff with with a, a very substantive issue that's important, but but might be in the form of a resolution that's non-budgetary. So. Um, would, would be very open to adding finance committee to it and seeing how it goes. Okay. Um, I, I do think that uh, work workshopping um, either a definition around what city business is or um, creating a decider um, can potentially be complicated. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to suggest, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Strauss, go ahead before I make, before I suggest a potential path forward. Go ahead. Thank you for letting me just keep piping in with my thoughts as we are in an iterative moment here. I would suggest city business without a definition and the city clerk being the decider. And I'll step back. Oh, city clerk. City clerk. City clerk. You want, are you suggesting the city clerk Either or the decider. city president? Uh, if. I'm happy with either, to be completely frank. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Usually we don't put our city clerk um, in the position of, of making decisions that could have political implications. So um, for the sort of sanity and uh, protection of the integrity and the independence of the city clerk, I, if we want to decide or I would really encourage us to look at a framework that required the council president to make the decision. Um, the reality is that the council president makes decisions every week um, on what gets referred, what doesn't get referred and where it gets referred. And so this, this again, doesn't prevent a resolution from moving forward. It simply opens up the door to whether or not a council member will be able to abstain. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what the effect I think is of, of adopting amendment two is, is just allowing for that opportunity um, to be that discretion to be to be exercised. What I was going to suggest is that um, that for the sake of keeping the ball moving here, I, I would suggest that we take a vote on Amendment Two, um, and that we um, in the next day or two work to create some amendment language that um, will be acceptable. Um, you know, I think I think I. I am inclined, um, I would like to see language that would either um, allow for an opportunity to uh, sort of uh, look at sort of city council business uh, determine, as determined by the council president language. And I think it's also important for us to have language um, that, uh, that, that makes it uh, about, you know, budget related um, legislation that comes from the finance or or select budget committees. In either instances, I will flag that I think that the council president is going to be put in the situation of making the call <laughs> as to whether something is budget related. So, um, so I think I, I think if 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 staff can put a little bit more thinking into those two potential opportunities, um, um, I would really greatly appreciate that. Um, and I think that uh, for today's purposes, I would like us to advance um, this resolute this amendment out of committee with the understanding that there will likely be some additional modifications. Does that sound is does that sound acceptable to members of the committee? Councilmember Mosqueda? 
Thank you, Council President. I just want to make sure that I um, heard you accurately. Were you encouraging council members to take a yes vote on this item? Um, I am encouraging folks to take um, a yes vote on this item for purposes of advancing it out of committee um, and making sure that we have uh, this as part of the base legislation for us to modify by either having uh, one of the two options that I've described. And um, um, uh, could the clerk please scroll up? Uh, we're talking about amendment number two, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, Madam President, I am happy to follow your recommendation on this. Uh, I will note, uh, no matter where I think the, the bill comes from, I think that it is a crucial part of our job that we have all of the council members voting on final pieces of legislation, regardless of uh, the committee and the impact. So I will vote yes on this, um, but I uh, was very much prepared to vote no. I do think that even as it relates to resolutions, I would like to see uh, council members taking a final vote in the final um, full council meetings, but I will take a yes uh, honoring your request today and look forward to follow up with you. Um, thank you, Councilor Mosqueda. And, and, um, and for um, the viewing public and any other council members um, who might disagree with including this in the base, um, there's always an opportunity to have an amendment to pull it out on, um, on Monday. Um, if that is something that anyone intends to do, I would ask that you contact our office right away so that we can uh, work with council central staff and the city clerk's office on uh, managing those, those logistics. Okay, any other comments or questions? No. All right, will the clerk please? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Council I'm Rosky. sorry, just so that I uh, I understand that, so we're not amending this at all to scope it to, you know, resolutions, for example. Um, this would be on items that have come to us that don't have an implication um, from the budget commit. Okay, go ahead, if you no. could repeat for me. No, 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 amendment two in its base form is what we're voting on. Amendment two is strictly limited to resolutions only. Okay, I apologize. I misunderstood. I uh, still have concerns about just resolutions, but I will be voting yes on this um, per your recommendation. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of amendment two? <laughs> Councilmember Warris? Aye. Councilmember Lewis? Yes. Councilmember Mosqueda? Aye. Councilmember Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? Yes. That's five in favor, none opposed. Great. Thank you so much. The motion carries and the amendment is adopted. Uh, okay. We have amendment three now. Um, I will move, oh, I will hand it over to Director Handy <laughs> to brief us on amendment three. I'm moving too quickly here. Go ahead. No. No problem. Um, Amendment three is co-authored by Councilmember Peterson and Councilmember Herbold. Um, I am characterizing this as a um, technical correction, and so invite you. Um, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but invite you to um, address it uh, with that amount of time and, and attention. Um, uh, each of these council members um, identified this issue um, in the underlying resolution um, in a different way. Um, so. V, actually, it might be helpful if you scroll up um, just so we can see the language that is actually changed. Yeah, right there. So just down a little bit more so we um, into membership, so we see three there. So the underlying, um, sorry, at our last committee meeting, we talked about the temporal nature of introducing legislation. At the time of introduction, any council member may sponsor a piece of legislation. When that legislation is in committee, only members of the committee may offer amendments to that legislation. Um, and um, an amendment to the resolution was um, clarifying that intent. And then at full council, any council member may again um, sign on as a co-sponsor. There was confusion about what does it mean to co-sponsor, what does it mean to sponsor legislation after introduction? <laughs> and um, to clarify that confusion, we are striking the word legislation here in three. So um, the, the change here indicates that uh, council members on a committee uh, may sponsor amendments before the committee. Um, our intent here again is a technical cleanup um, of this language. 
Great, thank you so much, Director Handy. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move Amendment 3 so we can have a discussion about, um, about this one. Uh, I will move to amend resolution 32029 as presented on Amendment 3 on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much. It's been moved and seconded to adopt Amendment 3 as presented on the um, agenda, I'm going to hand it over to, let's see, who wants to talk on this one first? Councilmember Herbold? Okay, Councilmember Herbold, I'm going to hand it over to you to, um, uh, excuse me, to, to talk through this one. Thank you for reading my body language. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Director Handy did a fine job of explaining it. It's uh, technical and clean up and just, uh, eliminates um, a confusing confusing reference to, to sponsoring legislation that has already been referred to committee, which is not possible that I don't think that was the intent of the language is drafted, but that um, is one reading of it. And um, this amendment clarifies that. Great, thank you so much, Councilmember Herbold. Anything to add, Councilmember Peterson? Okay, nothing to add. Colleagues, any other comments or questions? This is a technical amendment. We had um, a conversation about it at uh, last week's committee meeting and realized there was um, um, sort of a straggler word there that needed to be struck to capture the true intent. But any questions or comments on Amendment 3? I don't see any hands raised, so we're going to go ahead and call the roll. Um, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 3? Councilmember Warris? Aye. Councilmember Lewis? Aye. Councilmember Mosqueda? Aye. Councilmember Strauss? Yes. Okay. Chair I'm Gonzalez. standing right now. Aye. And then Councilmember Mosqueda, you are. So very much. Councilmember Mosqueda, you are not on mute. Oh, oh excuse me. So. <laughs> All right. Um, Chair the, motion, the motion carries. The amendment is adopted. Um, and we will now uh, move on to the next amendment. Uh, yes. The, the next amendment is number 10. I'll say that the next three amendments address um, sponsorship of legislation in some way. The numbering is, is the number in which we drafted them, but we are presenting a couple of these out of order um, to group them by subject matter. I'll note that none of these next three are in conflict with each other. Um, they all address sponsorship in some way, but operate independently. Um, uh, uh, so amendment 10 is authored by council member Strauss. Um, it creates a new provision that a piece of legislation that does not have a council member sponsor may be introduced as either executive requested or department requested um, legislation. You may recall from our discussion last week that the underlying resolution made a change to clarify the council's current practice that a, may, a bill may be introduced without a sponsor. This would further amend that change as described um, so that if it did not have a council member sponsor, um, uh, the council president could assign executive requested or department requested to that legislation. Great, thank you so much, um, Director Handy. This one uh, is, as mentioned by Director Handy, sponsored by Councilmember Strauss. I'm gonna recognize Councilmember Strauss to make his motion. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, this is, per our conversation last week, I took some time to help further refine what I meant as city business, et cetera, et cetera. You'll see on this um, amendment. Councilmember Strauss, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you have to make your motion first oh. before we can discuss it. Go ahead. Thank you. I move to uh, I move to I move Amendment 10 as a as described on the agenda. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Sorry for being such a stickler on the rules during a rules conversation here. Uh, it has been moved and seconded to uh, adopt Amendment 10 as presented on the agenda. Councilmember Strauss, you are recognized in order to address your amendment. Thank you, and thank you to the, all the city clerks that have uh, made me memorize that language at this point. Um, so thanks to them. Um, so what you'll see with this amendment, as well as Amendment 15 Order uh, O, uh, is that I'm bringing some uh, practices from the state legislatures that I've worked in. Uh, I've worked here at the city of Seattle for four years and I worked at the state legislatures for six to eight years, six years, I believe. Um, not counting doesn't matter. The, the intent of this 
uh, amendment is so that we never have legislation that uh, that comes out of thin air that we can't track to where it originated from and i also understand the need that there's sometimes legislation that comes before us that is not generated by any council member or the council president that is in the need for good governance and so this amendment would would demonstrate uh, and assign the department that requested the legislation or the executive themselves so that there is still a name associated with the legislation and uh, freeze the council to uh, oppose or support the legislation based on its merits. This is the practice in Olympia. Oftentimes uh, legislation is submitted uh, that does not have a sponsor or co-sponsor of the legislature, rather it is department requested and so following that um, that practice, this is my amendment. Great, thank you so much. Council Member Herbold, please. A you know, uh, question for the sponsor. Uh, one of the uh, bits of public testimony that we heard from the League of Women Voters was that um, additional language was needed to ensure that the practice is used rarely. Um, do you, uh, feel that this um, additional language that you're proposing um, mm -hmm. will help to um, maybe not ensure, but to, to, to facilitate um, a, um, a goal of um, minimizing the number of times that um, bills are referred without a specific sponsor. Yes, I did hear that testimony and that's a good flag. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. I had it on my notes and wasn't reading my notes. Um, I'm happy to have a friendly amendment to say this, this should be the exception, not the rule. I don't necessarily have language prepared for that, but it's welcome. Um, in, in sort of response to that particular commentary, I do, I do want to make part of the record in our conversation the reality that um, uh, it, it is, uh, my understanding is that it is currently the city attorney's uh, position that the charter and relevant Seattle municipal codes um, do allow for bills to be introduced without a sponsor. Um, and, and that's, you know, part of the reason why we included the language in the base resolution is just simply to memorialize um, that existing authority within uh, the charter and relevant um, Seattle uh, municipal code. So, um, so I, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, create the inference or the impression to members of the public or other council members that somehow we're creating some kind of new um uh right in terms of uh the issue of of listing legislation with a no sponsor required um uh that being that being said i do uh understand council member strauss's intent which is to create some additional transparency for members of the viewing public as to the genesis of the legislation if it is not coming from a specific um from a specific council member um, arguably it has been a little odd <laughs> to have legislation listed, um, on, um, the introduction and referral calendar with no sponsor, um, required. And it does sort of in practice present, um, a situation in which it's unclear as to which council member is going to actually speak to, uh, a particular piece of legislation if there is no one listed as the point person. So, um, I don't think that that last point I've made is resolved by having it listed as, um, you know, executive or department requested. Um, but but do do want to um, acknowledge that um, that I appreciate and understand the sponsor's goal to have some additional transparency around um, where the bill is coming from if it isn't coming from a um, legislator. Colleagues, any other comments or questions on this one? Okay. I'm not hearing any other comments or seeing any other hands raised, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask that the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 10. Councilmember Wars? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Mosqueda? 
Aye. Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? Aye. Yes. Five in favor, none opposed. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. The motion carries. The amendment is adopted and the amended bill is before the council. Amendment number 11. Take it away, Director Handy. Great. Um, amendment 11 is authored by Council Member Herbold, and it establishes the expectation that the council president will confer with the relevant committee chair prior to placing legislation on the introduction and referral calendar. And it addresses the situation specifically in the case where the sponsor of the legislation does not have the support of the chair um, who has subject matter jurisdiction in their committee on this issue. From our committee discussion last week, my understanding is that um, currently that is the practice and this amendment would clarify and standardize that practice by placing it in the council rules. Thanks so much, Director Handy. Appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and move this amendment to allow for discussion. Uh, I move to amend resolution 32029 as presented on amendment 11 on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, again, this has been moved and seconded to adopt amendment 11 as presented on the agenda. I am going to hand it over to Councilmember Herbold, who is uh, the designated author of the amendment in order to address it. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate, um, again, the opportunity uh, to address this issue. I appreciate um, the understanding that this is, in fact, the current practice. Um, I do feel that there is um, a real value of being able to um, to demonstrate to the public that this is the practice. I um, recall recently developing a constituent response to, um, uh, to constituents who were unhappy that um, the council had not um, introduced a piece of legislation. And I was looking for the reference that, no, it's actually part of the job of the council president to confer with the committee chair before deciding to circumvent a committee and send something to full council. So um, really uh, appreciate um, uh, that, that that is that is the practice, but also uh, would, would value uh, memorializing that practice so that the general public understands um, the decision making and the basis for the decision making of the, the council president. This again, this amendment would recognize the important role of committee chairs in setting and accomplishing um, an annual work agenda uh, by requiring the um, by by clarifying that the expectation is that the council president consult with the committee chair with jurisdiction over the legislation before putting it on the irc the council president this does not limit their ability to make an, uh, an independent decision about the irc and the sponsoring council member can um, still make a request to send it to the irc but i i believe this strikes a balance in recognizing the authority and the important role played by committee chairs thank you thank you so much council member herbold uh well said are there any comments or questions council member juarez please thank you madam chair um, Councilmember Herbert, I have a question for you, and you, I know that this is a, you're clarifying an ongoing practice. Would this, would the, I'm just going to be candid because we've, we've seen this happen. Would this kind of rule apply to not just the IRC and legislation, but if a committee chair sets deadlines for amendments and you know, I've, I've had this happen where a couple committee members were not happy or didn't meet the deadline and then went to the council president and said, you know, I want to be able to walk on amendments, but the council, but the committee chair had a deadline, which I didn't meet, but now I want to do it. Would this help, would that remedy this? Would this so remedy that? Yeah, sorry. Um, this is, uh, I think, uh, focused on a, a particular subject as it relates uh, to the decision to refer legislation uh, and, uh, to either a committee or a uh, or directly to full council, it's specific to the IRC process, not uh, amendments. All right, thank you. Yeah, and then um, Director Handy or or, or, or uh, City Clerk uh, staff, can can you address the portion of the council rules that does address the issue raised by Councilmember Juarez? Yes, sorry, I know that 
if you don't want to handle that, I can um, ask Liz. She has the rules open and available. Liz, can you review that? So this is this is the aspect, Liz, just to orient and here is the aspect of um, council members ability to bring amendments forward outside of the committee structure. Thank you. I am looking for it and we'll get back to you briefly. Okay. Um, no, no worries. Um, I would just say that um, uh, my understanding of the council rules, um, having been the council president for the last two years um, and on the council for the last six years is that uh, there is a separate rule that allows council members, whether you're a committee member or not a committee member to bring amendments forward um, up to noon of the day of our um, city council meetings, which is currently Monday. Um, so long as it's circulated by then, then you are able to um, bring that forward. So in order to address the issue um, raised by Councilmember Juarez, where a chair imposes a deadline for amendments, there would need to be an amendment to the council rules, it is my belief. There would need to be an amendment to the council rules to allow for a chair to impose a deadline and for there to be uh, not be an opportunity for a council member to circumvent that um, that that deadline. But I'm looking to council central staff or city clerk's office to affirm or clarify um, my my um, understanding of the rules. Certainly, uh, I can chime in here on the rule itself uh, regarding uh, amendments to bills and resolutions. Uh, it states that they shall not be presented at a city council meeting unless previously reviewed by the law department and circulated via email to all CMs, the central staff director, and the city clerk at least two hours before the meeting. In cases including but not limited to amendments to develop regulations subject to the Growth Management Act, a statute may require additional public notice and opportunity for public comment before an amended bill may be passed. So that is the current rule um, for amendments to be presented at a city council meeting. For my clarification, are you seeking any additional rules that apply specifically to amendments um, at committee meetings? Madam Chair, may I? Sure, go ahead. Um, no, I'm good. I just, I, I understood and thank you council president for clarifying. I, I, you know, I understood that part of the rule, but you were right. I wasn't thinking that quite through, but no, I think I'm good with what we have. So I'm ready to vote. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no worries. Council Mark Juarez. I mean, I, I really think that, um, some of us have, um, really exercised the practices chairs of setting deadlines for workflow management. I think, I think for the most part, we see a high compliance rate, but I certainly, um, appreciate the perspective that you're bringing that sometimes um, that is not the case and it can um, it could be um, frustrating and somewhat unpredictable so certainly hear hear that okay um, colleagues any other questions on amendment 11 I am not hearing any other questions on amendment 11 so I'm going to ask that the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of amendment 11 Morris I Lewis? Aye. Mosqueda? Aye. Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? Aye. That's five in favor, none opposed. The motion carries, the amendment is adopted. Okay, uh, amendment 19, Director Handy. Eight. Amendment 19 is also authored by council member Herbold and is one we are characterizing as a technical amendment. The underlying resolution, yeah, if you, if you want to stop right there, that's perfect um, on that language. Um, um, adds language to clarify uh, the number of sponsors that are added to a piece of legislation pre-introduction and outside of open session shall not meet or exceed a quorum. The language, um, sorry, in the underlying resolution said, um, uh, read meet a, a quorum and to be compliant with the Open Public Meetings Act, it should read meet or exceed. So an example with this amendment, a five member committee that has a quorum of three could have up to two sponsors um, added to the legislation prior to introduction and outside of open session. 
if additional sponsors were to be added, they would need to be added um, in open session in committee or at full council. Thank you so much, Director Handy. Uh, I move to amend resolution 32029 as presented on amendment 19 on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much. It's been moved and seconded to adopt amendment 19 as presented on the agenda. Councilmember Herbold, you are listed as the author. So I'm gonna hand it over to you to address the amendment. Nothing to add. It's technical, uh, correcting an inadvertent error. And thanks for flagging it um, at our meeting last week. Really appreciate that, um, that close eye to um, these details. Colleagues, any other questions on this uh, technical amendment? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 19? Flores? Aye. Lewis? Yes. Mosqueda? Aye. Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? Aye. That's five in favor, Madam Chair. The motion carries, the amendment is adopted, and we will now move on to the next amendment, which is Amendment 4. Amendment number four addresses um, council briefings. It is the first in a series about the council schedule. Um, um, amendment four is authored by council member Peterson and Juarez, and it would emphasize the ability of the council president to determine whether to conduct regular council briefings. The current language um, in the rules says that the council shall hold council briefing meetings and subsequent sections um, lay out the regular location and schedule of the briefing meetings. And it includes language that says the council briefings may be canceled by the president at any time. This amendment changes the shall to may language, <laughs> clarifying that the council may at the discretion of the council president hold council briefing meetings. Um, two more notes. One is that this amendment is compatible with the subsequent amendments you will consider 6ABC, which proposes changes to the council briefing date and full council meeting date. So you could adopt this and um, future amendments together. And um, finally, just one um, piece on logistics. It's the recommendation of the working group that if council briefing becomes more permissive, so you accept the may rather than shall language, and in the case that the council president does choose to hold council briefing meetings during the year, that that council president set a regular schedule for them alongside standing committees, um, which avoids sort of a burdensome noticing process for a bunch of special meetings for council briefing. So if you accept the, um, the May language here, the council president would have the choice to not hold council briefings at all. Um, if the council president is going to, um, the working group recommends that they set them on a regular schedule. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get the amendment before us so we can have a conversation. Uh, Councilmember Juarez, did you, uh, are you prepared to make the motion here? Let me grab my, yes, um, I, am, I am now scrambling what council member Peters or Strauss was doing. Um, I move that the committee uh, consider, um, trying to find it here, is it amendment number four? That's right. Correct? That's right. Thank you. Okay, so it's been moved to amend uh, resolution 32029 as presented on amendment four on the agenda. Is there a second? Can I second my motion? <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I will, I will, I will second it for you, Councilmember Flores. I'd be happy to do that. So it's been moved and seconded to adopt Amendment Four as presented on the agenda. <laughs> that would be quite the rule. Um, yes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to uh, Councilmember Wars. Did you want to address it first, or do you want Councilmember Peterson to address it first? I can address it briefly, and I'll let Councilmember Peterson take the laboring or um, in our discussions, and thank you, Council President, and thank you, um, Director Handy, and everybody else who worked on this with Elizabeth and Monica. Um, one of the main issues that I wanted to push this forward really had a lot to do with the fact that we are now um, virtual and um, the strain and the exhaustion on people, their mental health, their physical health, um, and screen time. Sometimes we're looking at a screen up to seven, eight hours a day multiple meetings in not just Seattle City Council, but of course, as you know, regional meetings, King County meetings, and then constituent. And so for me, um, I would like 
to um, change the shell to May so that the council president, it is more permissive and the council president does have more discretion, but um, that we also work with our phenomenal uh, staff um, to make sure that we um, meet the notice process, because I know that that's where the scramble comes in is making sure that there's notice and use, using the best use of our time when we're looking at a screen for the viewing public and for our constituents. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilmember Peterson, anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Council President. No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Great. Any comments or questions on this amendment? Councilmember Strauss, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councilmember Juarez and Peterson, for bringing this forward. I think we're changing mays and shalls and suspend, and it's really just splitting hairs between a shall and a may. Uh, and it's my understanding that the Council President can suspend the rules. My preference is that we keep it as a shall and suspend the rules. It's a very, I, I feel like I'm coming at this from the same uh, intention at, at all of you. I just want you to know where I'm standing. At. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Councilmember Strauss. Any other comments or questions on this one? Okay. Um, I, I do uh, plan to support um, this particular amendment, um, uh, colleagues. Um, I think it uh, reflects the intent of allowing the flexibility and the discretion for the council president to do it and document it, um, as opposed to just um, letting it live in, by inference in the rules of suspension. Um, so I, I do plan to su support this one and um, again, whether or not this plays out in practice <laughs> in terms of actually canceling council briefings is a different question, but at least there is the discretion to um, allow for it to occur should the council president um, in consultation with council members believe it, it would be prudent to, to cancel. Are there any other comments or questions? All right, hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of amendment four? Morris? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Mosqueda? Aye. Strauss? No. Chair Gonzalez? Aye. A sworn in favor, one opposed. Thank you so much. The motion does carry. The amendment is adopted. And we will now move to a discussion of a suite of amendments. Um, the next three amendments, 6A, 6B, and 6C, represent three different options for how to amend the council's regular schedule of council briefings and city council meetings. Since they are mutually exclusive alternatives, we can only adopt one of these three amendments. So in other words, colleagues, you have three adventures to consider before you. It's one, two, three. You cannot pick more than one adventure. So keep that in mind as you are voting. <laughs> All of these are mutually exclusive. Um, if you pick adventure one, that's your adventure, uh, assuming assuming it passes. So, um, so just want to make sure that folks understand that um, we will be discussing all three uh, amendments at the same time, but take votes individually. But I, but we will um, we will be putting all three options um, on the table so that we can have a collective conversation about uh, the potential options before us, and that folks can have a um a well-informed decision um when they are asked to vote okay uh councilmember strauss i'm gonna um call on you to to move your proposed amendment which is amendment 6a uh oh. council president oh i'm sorry we're gonna have a discussion sorry go ahead director handy sorry yeah, about I, that I, uh, our recommendation is that we explain the three and then invite yeah. a motion um and i'm going to pass it to dan to um tee these up Very yeah good. Uh, no thank i you. appreciate that again i've been i feel like just living with these amendments and and moving faster than than what i should be thank you for the reminder go ahead dan thank you very much um, v, I think it might be helpful uh, to put up the, um, the overview that shows the uh, status quo and the uh, three amendments related to meeting schedules. Uh, as the council president mentioned, uh, there are three options that have uh, been posted to the agenda, um, amendments 6A, 6B, 
and 6C. Um, my understanding is that uh, that one of these uh, amendments is not going to proceed, and I would ask uh, for confirmation from the sponsor um, uh, of 6C, please. It, and I will. Councilmember Mosqueda, um, you are the sponsor of um, proposed amendment 6C, so I'm going to recognize you to answer Dan Eater's question. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, um, uh, Deputy Director Eater. You are correct, colleagues. I am going to be limiting your adventure choices to two. Uh, we will go ahead and remove uh, 6C from the docket here today. Uh, just <laughs> I see cheering. Um, uh, just a quick follow up on this. Uh, in our last committee meeting, I had indicated interest in a Wednesday meeting. Given the discussions, I was interested in a Wednesday morning meeting, um, but uh, also. So uh, in conversations with the clerks, understand some of the limitations in terms of uh, how the committee meetings may sort of create compounding um, requirements on staff time, not just in the clerk's office, but I can imagine in our offices as well to reduce that complication. I will go ahead and remove 6C and look forward to talking more about the other two options. Thank you, Council President. Great. Okay. I appreciate that, Councilmember Mosqueda. I really, really do um, appreciate it. So we will focus um, the presentation from Council Central staff uh, and the discussion to proposed amendments 6A and 6B. Again, you have two adventure choices. You can choose one, but not both. Uh, thank you, Council President. So um, this matrix uh, has a lot of information on it. Um, I uh, thought it might be helpful to try to capture all of the uh, moving parts uh, that show what's in the what, what's labeled as in the first column as the status quo situation, and that's just what is in the um, the resolution that is before you before any amendments come up, um, and then. Uh, the next two columns labeled at the top 6A and 6B show you um, uh, how the amendment would change the status quo. So I think it might be helpful for me to uh, stay at the high level and then address any questions. At the highest level, um, the, the, the current situation reflected in um, the resolution before you uh, would have the briefings, the council briefings, uh, happen at 9.30 in the morning on Mondays, and the council meetings happen on uh, at 2 p.m. on Mondays, uh, and that is uh, the way uh, things stand today. Um, the uh, Amendment 6A would change the uh, briefings meeting schedule from 9.30 a.m. on Monday to 2 p.m. on Monday, and that is the same uh, for 6B. So there is no conflict uh, between the two amendments with respect to when the briefings happen on a regular basis. Um, the major change uh, in uh, from the status quo between 6A and 6B is with respect to council meetings, regular council meetings, would move in 6A from 2 p.m. on Monday to Tuesday at 9.30 in the morning. In 6B, council meetings would move from Mondays at 2 p.m. to Tuesdays at 2 p.m. So in both cases, you'd be moving from a Monday to a Tuesday, but the difference here is uh, that the regular meetings in 6A would be at 9.30 in the morning versus 2 p.m. Uh, uh, in 6B. The implications for those um, are, uh, as described in the next three rows, the, the most significant one is uh, when Mondays fall uh, on a legal holiday, there is um, a, uh, a rolling effect um, the, 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 that, are, that's, that are addressed differently in 6A versus 6B. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna give a, uh, a minute to this and then uh, I will open to questions. When Monday falls on a holiday, uh, the, the Monday briefings would move to a Tuesday in 6A. They would move to, um, uh, they would necessarily have to move to Tuesday afternoon because Mondays are proposed uh, to be, I'm uh, sorry, Tuesdays in the morning are proposed to be council meetings. So that means that the council meeting would also have to change if it's going to happen after the council briefing. 
So there's a change from um, briefings go from Monday to Tuesday on a legal holiday that falls on a Monday. Council moves from Tuesday to Wednesday. And then the committee meetings that would normally happen on those days both get bumped to uh, Friday in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, in 6B, there is a different approach for what happens with Monday holidays. Um, council briefings would be canceled. Uh, there are five or six of them, I think, that happen uh, throughout the year uh, where there, Monday is a legal holiday outside of uh, normal council recess at the end of August and December. Um, those five or six regularly scheduled council briefings under 6B would simply be canceled. Um, that means there would not need to be a change to the Tuesday uh, council meeting. It could continue as uh, regularly planned. Um, the only other thing that I'll highlight for you, although there are some implications for what happens when a uh, legal for a Tuesday, uh, uh, we don't have to talk about the Wednesday one anymore because C has been withdrawn. Um, but there, uh, C A also uh, talking about rule uh, uh, B eight, which calls for uh, the uh, any amendments that are going to come to council. Uh, to be uh, distributed at least two hours before the council meeting. If in 6A, the council meeting is at 9.30 in the morning, two hours before the start of a council meeting would be 7.30 in the morning. And so uh, 6A understands that that would be very, very early in the morning uh, and pushes the deadline to 5 p.m. on the preceding business day for any amendments coming to full council meetings. That's a lot of information I pushed at you. I'd uh, be very happy to answer uh, questions they have. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Really appreciate it. Um, Sue, now is the time uh, for us to have a conversation. I do want to get um, uh, these uh, amendments before us. I'm assuming that's why you're raising your hand, Councilmember Struss. So I'm going to go ahead and no, nope, you have you have a question about the actual proposals. Um, why, don't, why don't you go ahead and ask um, ask your question? Uh, great, thank you, Council President. It's more of a statement, and unless there is another council member that is very interested in 6A, I will go ahead and withdraw that amendment after hearing more from Dan Eater just now. Okay, Council Member Herbal. Uh, thank you, uh, Sponsor Strauss, on this one. I do have a question about um, the implications of withdrawing A and being left with only 6B. Um, as I understand the description of 6B, it would necessitate in every instance where there is a Monday holiday in briefings being canceled, as opposed to having the option of, um, of scheduling it at another day. Council President, would you like me to address that? Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, Councilmember Herbold, uh, you are correct that uh, regularly scheduled meetings would uh, would be canceled um, to the extent that um, the council president and council members generally wish to hold a council briefing during uh, such a week where there is a Monday holiday. Uh, there, I, I would defer to Elizabeth Atkinson and uh, uh, Monica Martinez to talk about the process for scheduling a special meeting of a council briefing. Uh, that is certainly um, uh, a, a, a distinct possibility uh, that would uh, still live within the council rules. Uh, you just would not have a regular meeting of the council briefings automatically move to another day. Yeah, I, I would say that the, cha the change here, Council Member Herbold, is to create an expectation that the council briefings would be canceled unless otherwise determined, predetermined by the council president um, in, in coordination with the city clerk's office to, to schedule that. Um, in order to meet the public notice requirements, I think that you would probably get pretty early notification of whether you could expect um, a council briefing on those weeks in which um, uh, they are scheduled to be canceled because of a holiday, but we'll call on um, Elizabeth or uh, Monica um, to, 
to provide a little bit more detail um, on that. Liz, do you want to address that after discussing that with the deputy city clerks? Sure, I would advise um, exactly what was contemplated is that um, the council will set the regular schedule. And so this would set a regular schedule where those Monday council briefings that fa fall on a Monday holiday would be canceled. And that would be the regular schedule. And then it would be up to the council president to schedule a special council briefing as needed in accordance with all of the noticing uh, requirements of the OPMA when it is so desired for those specific weeks. So I think that just is exactly um, in alignment with the other information provided. So again, we're setting a regular schedule, but it, it never precludes a special meeting from being uh, noticed. Um, I would say though, then the difference is when you do notice a special meeting, um, the agenda is set and the agenda cannot be modified at the time of the special meeting. So that would just be one difference there when you had a special meeting of the council for a council briefing is that nothing could be added to the agenda at the time of the meeting, such as an additional executive session, et cetera. May I ask a follow-up? Go ahead, Councilman Herbal, please. Yeah, I appreciate that the rules allow for the scheduling of a special council briefings meeting. I'm wondering logistically, under this scheme, is there time left on a four-day calendar to do that? Um, the uh, 6A, there under that scheme, there there is um, a, an available time slot. I'm not sure because I haven't done this 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 helpful exercise that I know you all have done. Um, is there a time slot that is available um, under 6B? Should it be necessary to schedule a council briefing uh, as a special meeting? If it's all right, I'll go ahead and uh, try to speak to that as well. Yes. Uh, so that would also then kind of determine, uh, be determined by the committee meeting schedule for that particular week. Um, as you're aware that our, our next biennial schedule for committees will be set in January of 2022. And then we'll know for sure when our standing committee meetings have been set. So I would say at this time, we don't, we don't know for sure. Um, we do know when the Monday holidays would occur for the next two years, those are pretty well set. Um, so we know there'll be about seven each year in the next two years uh, because of all of our federal holidays that we do observe. And so therefore that would be seven council briefings that would either be canceled, such as after um, the, the um, Martin Luther King holiday in January or the President's Day holiday in February. And then you would potentially be looking at those weeks dependent on a committee schedule of when you could fit it in um, to whatever has been determined at the beginning of the year. So not a straight answer, but at least a little more information on how you would be able to try to fit that in. Um, if it's okay, I, I'd like to chime in as well. Um, the, there is, a, you know, the current practice, uh, aside from the, the, the rules that have been introduced at this point um, and the amendments under consideration, the current practice is when a Monday is a holiday, uh, the briefings have been moved to Tuesday. Uh, the, any any uh, committee meetings that were regularly scheduled on Tuesday have been moved to Friday. So I do think that that is uh, an, uh, another avenue that if council members are partial to, we could, um, I, I don't want to work it up on you know, the specific language on the fly, but uh, I could work with council members uh, behind the scenes for a, uh, a further amendment uh, at council. Um, thanks, thanks, Dan, for that. Um, I, I'm not sure that we need um, a further amendment here to clarify that that would happen. I, I will say that I think that if there is um, the need to have a council briefing um, because uh, it was canceled due to a Monday holiday, um, we we effectively we would just do what we do now, which is work with the chair of the committee on um, who has a meeting at Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. To, to schedule them for Friday. Uh, Fridays generally are kept pretty clear in terms of the city clerk's calendar in order to allow for those things to, um, to be accommodated and for special meetings to be accommodated as well. So I think to, I think to answer your question, Council Member Herbold, I think there is, there would be an opportunity um, to do that um, is just a matter of putting it into effect on those weeks in which 
we know there is a Monday holiday that necessitates the canceling of the council briefing that will then put into play the need to coordinate with whomever the committee chair is on Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m. to schedule their meetings for the following Friday. I think that will all be determined in sort of granular detail once the next council president and the council adopt a resolution assigning uh, both the schedule and the membership of those committees, including the chairs. So, um, so I, I do think there is there is at least one day <laughs> um, to give you some flexibility to be able to have those council briefings if if needed. All right. Any other comments or questions on 6A or 6B? Okay, Councilmember Strauss, just confirming that you are still um, uh, withdrawing Amendment 6A. Yes, I'll defer to the wisdom of you and Councilmember Juarez. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, okay, colleagues. So we will only have one um, amendment to um, move here, and I'm going to get back to the right place in my script here. There it is. Okay. I am, uh, I'm going to move to amend resolution 32029 as presented on amendment 6B on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt amendment 6B as presented on the agenda. Uh, this uh, amendment is being uh, co-sponsored by myself and council member um, Juarez. Um, again, as the discussion just illuminated, there is no perfect scheduling option here when we are running really busy uh, committee schedules. Each comes with their own sort of set of challenges, but I think um, that 6B does present um, the most um, viable option that um, will allow for um, the fewest number of potential drawbacks um, um, in terms of scheduling and logistics. So um, I, I do think that maintaining city council meetings at two o'clock um, would represent the least disruptive changes to the current legislative process and deadlines for the publishing of agendas, materials and amendments. And, um, and having city council meetings at 9.30 a.m. the day before um, uh, actually, um, you know, I think would um, allow for us to, to, to have a little bit more time to, to work on things and not be as compressed by the time city council rolls around at two o'clock. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, happy that this amendment is uh, looking like it, it is um, viable. And my only regret is that I won't be able to benefit from it. So Councilmember Juarez, I'm gonna hand it over to you to make any additional comments. Oh, thank you. I wasn't gonna, but I'll just be very, very brief. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, and again, the reason why I think this is the best alternative, and I want to thank again um, the uh, clerk staff for meeting with us, getting back to not making staff work on Sundays, particularly during budget, but also being mindful that we do need to have our legislative briefing and our executive sessions, and that there's significant safeguards with discretion of the council president to move things around um, and having that time to prepare. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Juarez. Okay. Um, are there any additional comments on Amendment 6B? Councilmember Mosqueda, please. I am really excited as well that we are not going to be having full councils on Monday. And I want to thank <laughs> central staff, um, it, you know, following up on Councilmember Juarez's comments and yours, Council President. Um, the central staff have been willing to make themselves available and at the ready to craft amendments over the weekends and on nights and in direct opposition to the public comment that we heard this morning no worker should have to do that every worker deserves rest and time to be with their family and community and that um, is especially true from a body who constantly tries to lift up the work of uh, workers in every industry and i'm glad that we're able to move forward with this amendment today um, in light of the accusations and mischaracterization that I heard in my committee la yesterday as it related to uh, central staff as well, I wanted to make sure to take this opportunity to just thank central staff for all of the work that they do over the weekend and recognize that this amendment expands beyond um, our policy work and it really, I think, is going to be a level of um, good workplace balance, work-life balance for everyone involved. So thank you to the central staff, to the clerks who are on the line here, to IT, to um, the communications team, and uh, to Seattle Channel who all work to make sure that we're delivering 
uh, our deliberations in a public way on Monday, but very happy that this will not be the norm going forward and very much uh, look forward myself to more work-life balance uh, for everyone with this amendment. Councilmember Juarez, please. Thank you, I'll be very quick. Councilmember Mosquito, you forgot to thank our legislative staff, our staff in our office who find themselves working Sundays and Saturdays and on call and trying to redraft amendments. So thank you. <laughs> thank you thank for you. yeah for especially mentioning our teams and in our in our offices as well. And um, I, I want to acknowledge the uh, as the council president the work that uh, our council uh, sorry our our city clerks um, play especially the deputy city clerks who um, pull together scripts and are making revisions until the very last minute including over the weekend um and so i think this will be a um, a little bit of relief um for them as well and really want to um, appreciate appreciate that that needed balance for them as well councilmember herbold please uh, just one one more addition uh really appreciate that the working group gave us an opportunity to provide input to this rule early on. Um, and uh, because um, I'm, I'm sure others would have mentioned it, even if we all, as all nine of us um, didn't do so, um, my input was please in solving this problem for full council on Mondays, let's not replicate it for our committees on Monday. Um, and in, in particular, that would be a bigger burden, I think, on um, our individual office staffs. Um, so in, in tr trying to shift the burden uh, for the clerk's office, we didn't wanna uh, inadvertently create more of a burden for um, the legislative aid. So um, just wanna uh, thank the work group that in developing a proposal that they um, they considered that, that input as well. Agreed, Council Member Herbold, really important. Um, Sometimes in solving one issue, you inadvertently create another one, and that is certainly not what we wanted to, to do here, so appreciate that. Okay, colleagues, I do think this brings us to the conclusion of discussion of Amendment 6B, so in order to keep moving us along, I know we're running uh, rather long. I appreciate your patience and your commitment to staying on the line with us. Um, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 6B? Juarez? Aye. Mosqueda? Aye. Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? Aye. That's four in favor, none opposed. Thank you so much. The motion carries. The amendment is adopted. And we will now move to Amendment 5. Uh, I will hand it over to Director Handy to walk us through uh, Amendment 5. Thank you. And congratulations. You're through 10. There's only five more to go. <laughs> We're so close, we're almost there. Um, just as a point of context. Um, Amendment five is authored by council member Peterson and it addresses who may speak during a committee met meeting and at council briefing during the consideration of a motion that has been made and seconded. Um, specifically, this, would, this amendment would more explicitly provide the chair of a committee the power to determine whether legislative staff can address the committee when a motion is being considered. And it would create a new rule that presenters who are not legislative staff are not allowed to address the committee and um, or council briefing during consideration of a, mo of a motion. I'll just give that high level um, and happy to answer questions in the course of discussion. Thank you so much, Director Handy. Um, I'm going to move to amend resolution 32029 as presented on amendment five on the uh, agenda. Um, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt Amendment 5 as presented on the agenda. I'm gonna hand it over to Council Member Peterson who is the author of this amendment. Thank you, Council President. I'm excited about what, what just passed as well with 6B. I know it, it's it, a lot of us independently thought of this idea and it was great to see it there, there to be this independent consensus about doing something to relieve the, the weekend time and to, to having things on Tuesday is real big help. Um, so regarding this amendment, there might be different ways of doing this. Uh, sometimes we'll have, committees will have outside guests or interest groups at the table. 
um, and this uh, will still allow for that uh, input at the chair's discretion to have to have that input. It's it, it's really just saying, and especially important during these Zoom meetings when it's when it's um, everybody's on the screen and it's not clear what the rules are at that time. Once a motion is made and seconded, then it's really among the council members to have their deliberations. It's our turn as elected officials to have the to have the floor and and really um, hash things out as as elected. So that's that was what this amendment is is intended to do. Um, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Councilmember Member Peterson. Any comments or questions on Amendment 5? Councilmember Member Juarez, please. Thank you. And um, thank you for your patience, because Council President, you know that after this I have to go. But um, Councilmember Member Peterson and I had a talk offline, and so he knows that I was going to tee this question up. Um, yesterday, uh, Council President, we had what you're kind of dealing with today, 15 amendments, and some of them conflicting and having to go through them. And so I had posed to Councilmember Peterson, yesterday we had um, a panel and we had issues that were, there was a motion and a second in discussion amongst the committee. And as the chair, I felt that I had the discretion to ask one of our presenters to respond to some of the questions that were being raised by my colleagues. So what I wanted is for Councilmember Peterson to clarify um, I would, I would want to maintain the, um, the discretion and the leadership of the committee chair to be able to make that decision. I don't know if it needs to be a rule, but I'm certainly open to hearing um, specifically what you're trying to get at, uh, Council Member um, uh, Peterson. Thank you, Council Member Juarez. Um, I have some of the same sort of concerns and, and questions. Um, and um, would look to Councilmember Peterson to see if we can add any additional context or um, sort of the issue that is trying to be solved through this proposed amendment. Yes, um, so if we're having a committee meeting, um, so, so certainly the chair is able to invite guests to the committee table and um, it's just when we get, when the motion's in play that it's not, for somebody who's not an elected official to be uh, in the debate um, because other council members may feel pressure from that person. It may, it may, it may sort of freeze the discussion a little bit um, since we're there to make the decisions and, and, and after we've taken input from various points of view, not just those who are at the table. But the, the zoo presents an interesting um, situation where we were literally talking about a contract or an agreement with that, um, with that entity, and so it was helpful to have that person there for technical questions. But um, so I'd, I'd be open to um, refining the language, you know, you know, except for when we're negotiating a contract with or an agreement with somebody. Director Handy. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, the work group talked about a few different scenarios um, in this case. And the one that we, that we talked about most was the case um, where you have representatives of a department at the table and you are in a, a discussion such as this where you have moved motions and you are taking questions. In um, as written here, the chair could, um, the path for the chair to then invite a department member to answer a question would be to suspend this rule. So this gives the chair the, the authority to call on council members or call on legislative staff if they wanted to invite a member of the executive staff or an outside member, there would be a motion to suspend the rules in order to allow that discussion during the consideration of a motion. So procedurally, um, that's my understanding of what it would look like in practice. Thank you, Director Handy, appreciate it. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Councilmember Juarez and then Councilmember Mosqueda. So, um, Director Handy, don't we do that anyway? Do we need another layer of suspending the rules? I mean, I, I, could, I could call out many situations as the council president can as well for being on council for six years where sometimes at the table, a, a, a chair will invite a person that isn't particularly a subject matter expert or a department head, but is a activist or advocate for that particular issue where they find themselves 
um, the elected on the committee finds themselves having to um, pretty much debate the the guest. If that's what we're getting at, I'd rather we just say that. that that's what I'm trying to get at because ultimately it, the chair is the officer of the meeting and can make that call. But I'm, I'm again, I'm kind of struggling with what, what exactly we're trying to get at because I think we already have the power to do that. And like yesterday, wouldn't wouldn't just be limited to contracts. It'd be limited to anyone that's just sitting there. Sometimes we have people that don't even really represent a group, but have an opinion and are a friend or guest of the chair and sit at the table and respond and act like an elected and respond and at, even to the point of having claiming subject matter um, knowledge. So I'm I'm trying to get at is am I being a little bit too candid here or am I just not getting it? Well. Let me let me just uh, try one other way, and maybe if you could scroll up a little bit just to show the um, edited language here, so we're all yeah, looking at the same piece. Person. My uh, my understanding is that currently what you just described, Councilmember Juarez, is um, what the chair the power that the chair has. <laughs> the chair has the power to acknowledge speakers, both council members and guests or um, presenters at their committee during debate. Um, this would change that to say that no person other than a council member or as allowed by the chair, um, legislative department may speak. So if the chair wanted to allow somebody other than a council member or legislative um, staff to speak, they would need to suspend the rules. So it changes the power that the chair has um, mm -hmm. without suspending the rules. Okay, thank you. Ms. Uh Thanks so much. I know council president, we have a lot of amendments and we wanna keep as many council members on as possible. Um, I'm just gonna say uh, council members, I am not in support of this amendment. I think that again, we do have an opportunity to include people at the table that provide subject matter expertise, lived experience. Um, some of these individuals may be from the department. Sometimes we have a, a central staff there. I wanna make sure that council members are still having the opportunity to ask questions of folks at the table um, as they're considering items, especially from central staff and others uh, who might be subject matter expertise. Yesterday was a great example where we could ask about implementation and feasibility. So I think that there needs to be this, I don't think that this needs to be included there in, in statute. I do think that there needs to be a uh, strong understanding that it is the chair's prerogative of who is at the table and who gets to uh, field these questions. I myself, as Council Member Juarez knows, uh, had a lot of people at our table when we had a three person committee with Council Member Bagshaw when we developed the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, for example, and the hotel worker legislation that included both employers and workers. And we frequently had folks so that we had robust discussions, but it was never my practice to allow for council members to ask questions in the midst of a vote, but they absolutely were at the table as we were discussing items that were open for deliberation. Um, but I, I just think that it, it, it's limiting and I think we should consider uh, discretion given to the chair of the committee. So I'll be a no on this one. Great, thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, any other comments or questions on this? Uh, oh, Council Member Herbold, please. Thanks, I just wanna, um acknowledge um, and appreciate everybody's speaking real frankly here <laughs> um, about the the issue that Councilmember Peterson is trying to address here. Um, and I appreciate uh, both Councilmember Juarez and um, Councilmember Mosqueda um, wanting to defer to the power of the committee chair. I, I do wish there was some way to discourage the practice of a committee chair inviting continued debate um, from non-committee members once uh, a motion is, is put on the table. I think sometimes things that might be um, sometimes identified as uh, clarifying questions are um, really just um, an opportunity for um, somebody at the table who might feel differently um, from the committee chair um, or, or, or might, sorry, who might feel aligned with the position of the committee chair, um, just inviting them to make their case again, as opposed to truly providing uh, clarifying information. And um, I, I don't think that is um, aligned with sort of um, the rules of, of debate for a legislative 
body. I don't, I don't know if there's sort of a default under uh, Robert's Rules of, of Order, but um, I, I do wish there was a way that we could conceive of to discourage um, the use of the um, the chair's the chair's discretion in that way, and um, really appreciate um, Councilmember Peterson's um, efforts to sort of thread thread the needle here um, as a non-voting member. Just wanted to say that. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Um, I I do want to say that um, I I think that the language here, while I understand the intent and appreciate the um, desire to find a solution to the thing that Councilmember Herbold just described and that Councilmember Juarez was describing, um, I, I think this language is overly prescriptive and doesn't actually solve for the issue that is being flagged, because even if this amendment were to pass, any chair of any committee who wants to structure the conversation in the manner just described by council member Herbold can simply suspend the rules and allow for that to happen. And so I don't, I don't think, um, I think this is more of sort of a, a, a governance style issue as opposed to whether or not it can effectively be um, regulated or enforced through the council rules. Now, that being said, I also think that um, that this could be perceived uh, by some members of the public as being, um, you know, unfairly targeted towards um, those who may not share your view of the world. And I, I worry about that unintended consequence of, of actually, um, you know, formalizing a conversation or a debate too much to the point where you're not actually able to have sort of a fluid dialogue and debate about about the issue before you. And there's been many instances in which hearing from people um, presenting at the table, whether it's a department representative, somebody from the mayor's office or uh, a member of the community, I have been persuaded to think otherwise about a particular issue. And, and so I think in the spirit of sort of transparent deliberations, I do think it's important for us to uh, make sure we're not creating rules that might inadvertently suppress um, the ability to engage in that manner. I know that's not what the intent is with this particular <laughs> amendment, and I'm not suggesting that that um, is the intent, but I just, am, I'm, I'm really struggling with seeing how this rule, given the reality of how rules can be suspended, um, will um, sort of solve for, for the issue that is really truly at the discretion of a chair of a committee and that discretion is going to be exercised in a manner in which that independently elected official wants to exercise it um, in this instance. So, um, so I, I don't think I can support this amendment in its current fashion, um, and but do appreciate Councilmember Peterson's um, intent in bringing it forward. Okay, colleagues, um, as you heard, Councilmember Wires is going to have to leave after this vote. We still will have quorum. We've confirmed that Councilmember Mosqueda and um, Strauss can stay on the line until we get to the very end. Um, appreciate that um, willingness to do that. So if there are no other questions or comments on Amendment 5, hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 5? Councilmember Wires? Aye. Councilmember Mosqueda? Um, no. Councilmember Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? No. That's two in favor, two opposed. Council, Council President, yes. I made a mistake. All right. Do we need to recall? I mean, yeah, I, yes, I apologize. I meant to vote no. Okay. Um, Clerks, Deputy Clerk Schwinn, do I need to make a motion for reconsideration or? Um, we haven't, you haven't announced the, the vote. Let's just go ahead and recall the, recall the vote. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm on two different screens. I apologize. No, that's okay. That's okay. All right. Um, Madam uh, Clerk, can you call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 5? Councilmember Juarez? No. Councilmember Mosqueda? No. Councilmember Strauss? No. Councilmember Gonzalez, uh, Chair Gonzalez? No. That's um, none in favor um, or opposed. 
Um, the motion fails. The amendment is not adopted and we'll move to the next amendment. Councilmember Juarez, thank you so much for hanging in with us. I know you have another commitment. Appreciate your extra time this, um, this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, colleagues. I have a really important emergency that I need to attend to, so I apologize. Thank you. We, we appreciate you making time for, um, for as long as you did. Really, really appreciate it. Okay, colleagues, we're going to move to the next amendment. Uh, we are getting close to the end, so thanks for bearing in with us. Uh, the next uh, amendment is 12, and I'm going to hand it over to Director Handy to walk us through this one. Thank you. Um, amendment 12 is sponsored by Councilmember Strauss and it would limit the topics for public comment at um, council meetings, um, and it would limit it to matters on the introduction and referral calendar and committee reports on that day's agenda. Um, it would eliminate the ability um, of members of the public to offer comment at council meetings regarding other items that may be included in the council's adopted annual work program, sort of the broadest category currently listed in the council rules. This amendment relates to full council um, only and um, does not change the comment um, rules for committee meetings. Okay, thank you so much for that, Director Handy. So this uh, this uh, amendment is sponsored by um, Council Member Strauss. So I'm gonna hand it over to Council Member Strauss to make his motion on Amendment 12. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Council President. I move to amend Resolution 32029 as presented on the, uh, uh, presented uh, as Amendment 12 on the agenda. Excellent. Is there a second? Uh, Councilmember Strauss, I'll go ahead and second um, the motion for purposes of discussion. So it's been moved and seconded to adopt Amendment 12 as presented on the agenda. I'm gonna hand it over to Councilmember Strauss to present his amendment. Uh, thank you, Council President. It, I, this is simply making committee rules for public comment the same uh, at full council to allow us to conduct our business efficiently and effectively. I think it is important to keep public comment uh, and to keep it related to the work we are engaging in that day. And so anything that's on the IRC, anything that's on the agenda, if this uh, change is too much for some, I would be welcome to also then setting up public hearings once once a quarter, twice a year um, for people to comment on the work plan as a whole. But uh, as we all know, there are so many, everything under the sun is included in the work plan. And um, it would allow, from my perspective, it would allow us to more efficiently and effectively conduct our business with this change. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Strauss. Any uh, comments on Amendment 12? Okay. Councilmember Mosqueda, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Councilmember Strauss, I appreciate the intent of where you're going with this. I know um, often we get testimony on a number of items that are not on the full council agenda. Um, I do wonder about uh, enforcement. We don't really have a culture of gaveling down folks who are not speaking to items on the agenda in our committees. So um, is this contemplating also the sort of uh, cultural change that would accommodate that? And, and how does that sort of look for 2022 and 2023 if these are adopted um, in our committees as well. Thank you, Councilmember Mosqueda. This is already the rule in committee. And so uh, in committee is only, what is before the agenda? Sorry, do you have a clarifying question? Sorry, Madam President, um, if I might just clarify. Um, yeah, that's sort of, what I'm trying to get at. We already have this rule in our committee and I just, uh, perhaps I haven't seen it in the committees that I sit on and in the way that I'd share it, but often we have people who call in and maybe they have a comment that is not on the agenda for that day. We often don't gavel them down. And so I'm wondering if the concept here is um, to apply the same rule that we currently have in committee, but also is there kind of an expectation that we would be enforcing that in our committees as well? I can see how culturally that, that process change for some might 
be challenging to accept and challenging for us to implement. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Mosqueda. I do believe it is the discretion of the chair, or in this case, it would be the discretion of the council president, whoever's chairing that committee. Um, I know we all run our committees a little bit differently. Uh, I do have in my committee very strict parameters. Um, and even I have gaveled down people that I support and with the tree song in particular is a really great example. When everyone in the uh, audience stood up and started singing, they were out of order, uh, even though I loved the song. <laughs> just by way of example um and you know i do think that if if another change or people we also have the work plan that comes before city council once a year and that is not another opportunity for everyone to comment on all things included in the work plan it's just an exhaustive list um yeah thanks okay great uh Councilmember Herbal, please. Um, thank you. Uh, the discussion here um, and uh, Councilmember Mosqueda's questions about um, the, cha the the use of uh, discretion um, reminded me of what my recollection is for the genesis of this change as it relates to full council and making it broader. Uh, to include other matters directly related to the council work program while still while still you know creating some connection to the work that we do was that there was concerns that of um, that discretion was being used in a way and when you use discretion uh, when it relates to speech um, you could be creating a situation where uh, an outside observer thinks that you're using your discretion as committee chair uh, to choose the kind of speech that you want to hear. Um, and so I, um, uh, again, non-voting member, but just wanting to kind of put that out there as um, my recollection of why um, this was, was, was broadened in the first place. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councilmember Herbold. I was going to um, chime in with that as well. Um, we had actually uh, made a choice to, to, to broaden this um, largely in response to um, some concerns about um, being, being overly prescriptive and restrictive of people's First Amendment speech rights um, at, um, at full council in particular. My worry about this um, amendment, uh, should it move forward, is that now we are creating a scenario in which um, members of the public have no other avenue to regularly provide uh, and exercise their First Amendment rights um, about other portions of the council's work program. Um, so if this rule is, is the same in committee meetings and the same at city council meetings, then, um, then it really does restrict um, a, a, a member of the public's ability to make comments on things that may only be tangentially related um, or indirectly related to the work that we do on the city council or to frankly work that we should be doing as a city council that um, we aren't prioritizing, but maybe should be. <laughs> and so I think, um, so my concern really on this one, while I, you know, uh, appreciate the intent. We've all presided over a lot of public uh, comment um, periods. I, I, I do I do think that that this um, this um, for me tips sort of uncomfortably in the direction of creating an unintended impact on um, on um, on people's First Amendment's rights to speak to their government and and make their opinions heard on the body of work that we do, whether we put it on an agenda or not. Councilmember Strauss, please. Thank you. Uh, that uh, historical uh, information, institutional knowledge from you and Councilmember Herbold is helpful. I don't need to move this amendment forward at this time. The, I, I, I do believe though, with that said, that the way that we operate public comment at full council does create a barrier to conducting our work efficiently and effectively. So I just need the way that we are operating today creates a barrier to our work being conducted efficiently and effectively. I just have to say that twice because that is how I am perceiving our work to be done at this time. Yeah. And Councilmember Strauss, I would just say that hearing from members of the public 
is part of our work as elected officials. Um, that's why we have public comment listed on our agenda. So um, that is in particular why um, I am very careful about saying that we're gonna move to other items of business on our agenda because hearing from the public is part and parcel um, of our business. So I, I, I acknowledge that we get a lot of public commenters who call in and sometimes it can be up to an hour, um, but uh, it is our responsibility to to hear from those members um, of the public. So I'm hearing that council member Strauss would like to withdraw amendment um, 12. Uh, council member Skeda, anything else you'd like to add here before we move on to the next one? No, I just wanted to, um, to appreciate the conversation and also note uh, council member Strauss's uh, last comments there, which, which I appreciate as well. I think that as I've been looking at the rules and thanks again to the clerks for all of your work and helping to pull up the procedural um, emotions and uh, Robert's rules of order, you know, perhaps there's more uh, council member Strauss that we can do to continue to look at the language about avoiding uh, refraining from speaking adversely about individuals, ref, uh, refraining from speaking against one's motives, and um, refraining from disturbing the assembly. These are all items that currently relate to council members. But I think that there is, an, an, you know, some some element there of how we'd like to make sure that our decorum uh, continues to be respectful, so that everybody can engage uh, and look forward to the future conversation. But I appreciate that it was withdrawn. Yeah. Um, yeah, as someone who has spent a lot of time with the rules, um, um, you know, I've heard pretty, pretty clearly that even if it is, um, speech about a council member's intent or motives or, um, mode of doing business, uh, it is still protected by the first amendment, which is part of the reason why, um, I have not been able to, um, do anything other than encourage people to choose a different way to express their First Amendment uh, rights. But, um, you know, I appreciate that that is an ongoing concern. Happy to share, um, you know, past legal opinions that I've gotten from the city attorney's office so that you all um, are on the same page as you transition into the next year um, on that particular issue. But um, unfortunately, uh, even disparaging comments um, is still protected by the First First Amendment. So, okay, we are going to move on from Amendment 12. Thank you, Councilmember Strauss, for bringing that forward and for allowing us an opportunity to have um, debate and conversation in, in this public setting. Really appreciate it. Next up is uh, Amendment 13. So, I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Strauss to make his motion on Amendment 13. Uh, thank you, Council President. I move to amend Resolution 32029 as presented on the agenda as Amendment 13. Thank you so much. I will um, second that motion. So it's been moved and seconded to adopt Amendment 13 as presented on the agenda. I'm going to hand it back over to Council Member Strauss to address his amendment. Uh, thank you. This is codifying what we already have in place as Robert's Rules uh, uh, debate. Uh, the change is from the Roberts and uh, Mr. Eater, if you could correct me, uh, just it's my understanding Robert's rules is 10 minutes of debate. I've reduced it to five minutes of debate unless all CMs uh, agree by voice to extend the limits. Uh, while it is five minutes, it, everyone has an opportunity to speak twice to a motion. So any motion for amendment, any motion, any motion, you get two cracks, five minutes each. It's, I just want to codify that. Uh, thanks, Council Member Strauss, and I just realized I forgot to give Council Center staff an opportunity to present on it. So um, <laughs> I apologize for skipping that stuff. Um, Dan or Esther, did you want to um, uh, add some additional information there? Um, I only wanted to uh, address Council Member Strauss's um, question about uh, about Robert's rules, and I would just say I would defer to the city clerks, who I believe are uh, more expert than I am about what is in the um, the 12th edition of Robert's Rules. Okay, thank you. Um, and, is there anything else to add um, in terms of this amendment before we hear from the deputy clerks? No. Um, Monica or Elizabeth, um, anything to add in terms of, res of responding to Councilmember Strauss's uh, question related to um, debate? Yes, I am not 
sure that we uh, we actually brought this up in the with the deputy city clerks and in reviewing um, edition 12. But Liz, you may have done that separately. Could you report on the findings? Uh, yes, certainly. So yes, as stated, uh, Robert's rules does have um, some items uh, divide. Um, excuse me, regarding debate. Um, it does contemplate a maximum time for each speech. And Robert's Rules provides that if no special rule is in place relating to the length of speeches, a member having obtained the floor while a debate motion, a debatable motion is immediately pending, can speak no longer than 10 minutes unless obtaining the consent of the assembly. Um, and this is permissive through a unanimous consent or by means of a motion to extend the limits of debate requiring a two thirds vote. So again, this would be a, a situation where we don't have a specific rule, a special rule within our own council rules that addresses the limiting of debate as it is per speech. Um, but this would be kind of some general guidance from Robert's rules around this 10 minute time frame, um, and then being able to kind of expand with that unanimous, unanimous consent. Uh, so sometimes the idea that you, you haven't risen, um, that a point of order has not been raised to say, we have reached 10 minutes of this particular speech. May, can we move on through a point of order? It would be potentially considered a unanimous consent that that individual would be given more time to speak. So I think, again, it's it's rules that you, you do have available to you, tools that you currently have available to you, and this would just be um, shortening that time to a special rule. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth, for that. Any comments or questions, Councilmember Mosqueda? Um, thanks so much, Elizabeth. Uh, is there any history that we have at our fingertips on this? I thought it was limited to two 10 minute sections per day. Did they recently change that perhaps in the most updated version? Of Robert's rules? Uh, yes. And then the, the second piece there would be the number of speeches on the same question per member per day would be twice. So again, there is a Robert's rules sort of recommendation, no more than two of those speeches per topic. Um, and certainly then you could go to the unanimous consent if it was other, otherwise provided for at the time of the meeting. So Elizabeth, just so I'm clear, the Robert's rules of order currently say that each member um, has an opportunity to speak twice, which I knew, but the limit is 10 minutes per time for a total of 20 or it's 10 minutes total? Yes, it does say maximum time for each speech. So no longer than 10 minutes um, per each speech with up to two speeches on the same question per member per day. So that's 20 minutes total. Yeah, excuse me. Those are kind of those general parameters of Robert's rules. Again, trying to keep things efficient, try to keep things equitable so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, and then also, you know, that uh, overlying rule of trying to hear from everyone first before you go through that second round of speeches. So these are all kind of uh, recommendations for how to kind of proceed efficiently through debate, um, especially when you have a subject that is um, a, a popular topic for, for additional commentary. Okay, and then Council Member Strauss's amendment as presented here would modify those general rules um, and limit debate to five minutes uh, total, but still allow for two speeches. So you could do two and a half minutes and two and a half minutes, or you can do all of your five minutes, but then you wouldn't get a second speech. Is that my understanding or is it five minutes per speech? What is the effect of, of, of this amendment in terms of that total time? Director Handy. My, my understanding is it is um, they you can continue to have two speeches each at five minutes um, for a total of 10 minutes. Okay, so a total of 10 minutes. So we're shaving off 10 minutes. Okay, got it. Um, that is helpful clarification. I, I do want to flag that I think enforcement on this is a little tricky, which is probably why we don't normally do it. Um, and um, I'm not saying that it's not necessary. I'm just sort of um, acknowledging that this, the burden of enforcing this will likely, um, you know, fall 
primarily to the next um, uh, council president, but certainly to all of the um, chairs of committees as well. And so in order for this to actually have the intended effect, it will need to be consistently enforced by both chairs and the council president um, or council president pro tem. So just want to sort of um, flag that that that's kind of my primary concern here is with implementation and not necessarily with intent, but do want to open it up to any questions or comments from colleagues. Councilmember Herbold, please. Um, yeah, this is, I think, a good opportunity to flag um, one of the items that I had intended to bring forward. I didn't because um, of the, um, I, I did a I didn't bring it forward for a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons was the um, inability to uh, to enforce. Uh, we don't currently have the ability to turn off a single mic of a single one of our colleagues. Um, and not that turning off the mic of one of our colleagues is the best way to enforce, but absent another way to enforce. Um, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I don't, I don't think of the um, council rules generally as um, a, a structure that is about enforcement. I think as Council President Gonzalez said in our last meeting, it's more um, about a shared set of expectations um, that we have for one another. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to lean too heavily on um, whether or not something can be enforced or not. But the, in the instances where, um, you know, some of the changes I've been interested in, um, I've wanted to put forward. Um, I, I think they've, they've arisen because of um, a divergence uh, among our colleagues about about those expectations. So um, just just saying here that um, you know on, I, I'm I'm of two minds um, on this one. Again, as a as a non non voting member. Um, I would maybe uh, appreciate <laughs> um, the, the uh, structure and the discipline that would be necessary to limit um, my speaking uh, to five minutes. I think that would be um, really helpful and useful and um, a, a, a good challenge towards the goal of uh, being more effective and efficient. Um, on the other hand, if if we're identifying this because of a problem that we have, um, a, creating a new expectation um, that we're that we're flagging because of a problem that we have um, becomes difficult to contemplate because then the next thing is really about the enforcement of um, of that solution. So, not not I know clear as mud. My apologies, but just letting you know my my thinking on that. Appreciate it, Councilmember Hobel. Any other comments or questions on this one? Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So I think um, I'm gonna go ahead and close out debate and um, call this one for a vote as well. So will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of amendment 13. Mosqueda? No. Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez. No. That's one in favor, two opposed. Okay, uh, motion fails. The amendment is not adopted and the amended uh, bill is still before the council. We have um, another amendment to consider, which is amendment 16. I'm gonna hand it over to Director Handy to uh, brief us on this amendment. Thank you. Amendment 16 is authored by council member Herbold and it would allow council members to attend regular, special, and emergency meetings of the city council electronically. Um, it would require council members to provide notice to the council president 48 hours in advance of a regular meeting that they plan to participate electronically. Um, so that's for both a regular or special meeting. In the case of a special meeting that's noticed with less than 48 hours, um, or in the case of, of an emergency meeting, a council member simply must provide notice. Um, we, we sort of lift the timeline on that, recognizing those um, maybe time sensitive meetings. And as discussed in committee last week, the current rules only allow for electronic participation in very specific cases where a council member would be entitled to family and medical leave, paid parental leave, um, or paid family care leave. 
those current rules have been suspended during the pandemic to allow for full electronic participation. So this would be um, amending the permanent rules um, post civil emergency. Great, thank you so much, um, Esther, appreciate it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move this so we can have a discussion about it. I move to amend resolution 32029 as presented on amendment 16 on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt amendment 16 as presented on the agenda. I'm gonna hand it over to council member Herbold to make some remarks. Thanks so much. So um, my goal with this amendment is to strike a balance between the realities of governing during a pandemic, the success that we've all had telecommuting and the need to return to our civic building. I believe um, we should really think about how to come back to work in our offices as we are able, but I also want to permit electronic participation when and where it's needed. I also recognize that hybrid meetings with some in person and some participating electronically um, are something we haven't yet tested um, and that this is an area where we might need to fine tune after we have some additional experience. I think we do know enough uh, now to know that um, the current rules, which allow e-participation only for a few a few number of items of uh, that sort of meet these qualifying conditions, that that is going to be too constraining moving forward. So this amendment allows council members to participate electronically with advance notice given to the council president of at least 48 hours um, in situations such as special or emergency meetings when the meeting is called within 48 hours uh, and rendering 48 hours is thus impossible. Uh, council members may give timely advance notice striving to, to no notify as soon as possible. If a council member has failed to give advance notice, they can still participate electronically if co council colleagues approve their participation with a vote. Um, and my hope is that this really um, provides us with electronic participation tools we need while encouraging us to communicate well with each other in advance whenever possible about our method of participation. I think we had um, discussed uh, in the last committee meeting um, a, you know, a sort of a that we would send around um, uh, uh, an opportunity, sort of like you know we do with the OTEM calendar, an opportunity maybe once a month or once a quarter um, of individuals to come forward and say, um, I know in advance that um, I'm going to need to participate electronically for this set of meetings. But I just felt like that um, that sort of a solution was uh, was more rigid than what I was hearing from the committee discussion um, in the last meeting. So just putting forward this as an alternative. Thank you. Great, thank you so uh, much, Council Member Herbold. Um, are there any comments or questions on Amendment 16? Council Member Mosqueda, please. Um, having, um... Uh, voted to second this. I want to note, Councilmember Herbold, I, I uh, supported a second to put this in front of us so we could have the debate. But unfortunately, uh, this is not an amendment that I am able to support right now. And um, I'll let you know why. I do appreciate the intent behind it. I think that there's clearly an interest in making sure that we have more streamlined um, understanding of what's expected from council members. I do think that there's some unintended consequences here with this from a equity and public health perspective. Early on in my first term, uh, folks probably remember we did a lot of work with with, with the council members that are here, council member Gonzalez, council member Herbold, you were very supportive of our efforts to try to make more flexible rules so that we could have participation, especially for those who needed to take care of um, kiddos or elderly parents. At the time we had colleagues who were both dealing with that. I think similarly, if um, we have a council member who needs to participate electronically, whether or not that's because they have a health related issue personally, uh, whether, you know, for example, in this moment, they're worried that they were exposed to COVID, uh, whether they have a kiddo or a um, parent who needs care of some, uh, some form, I want them to be able to provide, uh, provide folks with the option to do that without having to necessarily explain to the world why they are participating publicly are participating through these alternative um, means and i i hesitate to support something that has a decision that's left up to individual 
council members to decide what constitutes as a good enough reason for not participating uh, through traditional um, uh, means and modes uh, for the committees or full councils. So uh, appreciate sort of the intent behind this. And I think um, it's important for us to make sure that council members still have the discretion themselves to determine how to do and do their job and participate in the meeting. I, I definitely just want to make sure that we're not creating another, you know, unintended situation where council members also might come to work sick or might participate in a meeting, um, even if it's, it, you know, having the opportunity to participate through um, new technical channels. We want them to be able to be with their loved ones when they need to and to not feel maybe pressure to come to a meeting if, um, if they are nervous about disclosing why they need an alternative way to participate. So. I look forward to working with you all to make sure that we are providing um, clear access for the public to understand how our voting processes are done. But I just don't want us to be in a situation where we're creating unintended consequences with this. And um, to the, the amendment right now, I think, looks like it's uh, taking a step back from some of those important uh, protections that we put into place. I think it was early 2018. So for that reason, um, I would be hesitant to support today. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate that. I do um, see a, a few hands raised, at least three. So um, I'm going to go in the order in which uh, they were raised. First is Councilmember Strauss, then Councilmember Herbold, and then Director Handy. Uh, thank you, Councilmember, uh, Council President. Just trying to clarify here, six and seven are these both being added i would be happy with six but i don't think that we need to have a vote of the majority of council members they, Notice, they are I, both yes they are both being proposed to be added as part of this um amendment um i am uh, gonna hand it over to council member herbold and then director handy because i think uh, based on that question and based on Councilmember Mosqueda's um, comments, um, I think there might be a confusion about why the rules exist the way they exist now. Um, and, and so um, perhaps Councilmember Herbold plans to address that and Director Handy does as well. So I, I, I won't um, belabor the po uh, point and just uh, uh, recognize Councilmember Herbold and then Director Handy. Thank you. Um, so I'm, my intent is probably <laughs> to defer to uh, Director Handy, um, but just um, because I think uh, Director Handy understands my intent and understands um, the language is drafted, but I just want to clarify the language that you see um, under number seven is just a reordering of the existing language that is currently up um, under not up and under under uh, six. So uh, the current language and under uh, under number six is now placed under um, number as as number seven and placed under the new number six. Um, and there's um, uh, in the circumstances um, where uh, a council member is not able to be present at a regular council meeting. Um, there's there's no um, obligation for anybody to explain why, um, nor is there under the the uh, current circumstances, um, nor is there uh, a requirement to inform the um, the council president for the the reason why they're um, they're planning the absence. I do um, note that. Uh, I'm, not sure that in um, moving the language from six, the original number six into uh, a new number seven, we lost reference to rule 2D4, which I think we need in order to, um, to address council member Mosqueda's concern. I, you know, when, if somebody is out for the reasons that are currently contemplated in our current rules. Um, and so sickness, FMLA, there's a, a set of rules. Um, there isn't an expectation for this advance notice. Um, so just, uh, again, uh, turning it over to, um, uh, sorry, Director Handy to, to clarify um, how that intent was, was captured. 
Thank you. And um, Dan, you and I can tag team the specific language here because um, part of what um, this amendment says is that this, this rule currently lives in three sections, <laughs> one about the regular rules, one about special meetings, and one about emergency meetings. And the council rules, as stated, currently have slightly different rules for each. <laughs> The intent here is to provide significantly more flexibility to council members so that for any circumstance, all that is required is 48 hours notice of a meeting. If a council member was out on extended leave or knew that they were not able to be at the council um, for a month at a time, they could provide the council president with a notice that says for the next you know, 30 days, I, will, I plan to per participate electronically um, in all circumstances. And so the intention is not that, um, it is not written such that for every specific meeting, you would be able to have to provide that notice. Um, but if you were normally participating in person, um, you could provide a 48 hour notice that you were you know, going to be out of town or that you were sick or something that would allow you to participate electronically. Um, and I believe that we, because of the increased flexibility um, chose to strike the language about the paid medical leave and the family leave because this was more expansive. Dan, do you want to explain in any more technical detail um, how um, how that is done in the amendment? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Esther. Um, so for uh, regular meetings, uh, which are you know scheduled routinely at the same uh, day and time, uh, each committee meeting, um, the expectation is that uh, council members would provide um, the committee chair or the council president in the uh, in the event that we're talking about the uh, the council meeting um, with um, 48 hours of notice at least in the event that that doesn't happen there is still a provision for uh, the full council and the council meeting to uh, vote by a majority um, uh, a vote that would allow a council member to um, uh, attend electronically if, um, for instance, there was a, you know, a late breaking um, illness that kept the council member uh, away from uh, a, an in-person uh, meeting of the council. Um, that's for regular meetings. For special meetings, um, if you could scroll down, I'm not sure who's controlling uh, at this point. The, the amendment itself, but I'll just keep talking. Uh, for, for special meetings, um, there, the, there's a recognition that sometimes special meetings are called uh, less than, or f with, with less time than 48 hours of advance notice. Um, in, in that circumstance, uh, council members will endeavor to provide um, as early notice as practicable. Um, and, but there is still the, uh, the, the, the fail safe that, um, uh, the, the full council can take the vote um, at the council meeting to allow a council member who has not been able to provide notice uh, ahead of the start of a special meeting uh, to participate electronically. And then the final um, section that Esther alluded to is emergency meetings. These are by nature um, uh, uh, last minute kinds of uh, meetings, at least at least logically possible. Um, due to uh, you know a, a natural disaster or what have you, um, and in that case, uh, if we could scroll down, please, to the next section. Um, th this uh, this to this doesn't set a forty eight hour a window. It just says you know before the meeting starts, uh, the council member should notify the. Um, the council president uh, of a desire or a need to attend electronically. Uh, but there is also, uh, I believe if you scan a little bit further, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, item five there is uh, the same kind of a, a vote that could happen in the event that prior notice wasn't provided uh, that would allow a council member to attend electronically. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, um, Esther. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, and then I think I saw Councilmember Strauss's hand up. I'm not sure if he still wants to get in here, but Councilmember Mosqueda, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Herbal, thank you for clarifying your intent here. I appreciate it. Uh, colleagues and my friends from Central Staff, that is not the way I'm reading this language. It very clearly says for regular meetings, 
for any reason the council member may participate and vote in electronic meetings provided that the council member informs the council president at least 48 hours in advance that is new information and does not include the same language that we included in 2018 when we updated the information on number seven it says council members if a council member is not able to present at a regular council meeting and if approved by a majority of council members present and at a voting meeting that is a difference from what we currently have so both require advanced notice of 20 48 hours and approval by a majority of council members present and voting and it doesn't i don't think contemplate that somebody might not be able to give that advance notice to the council president both for regular meetings and for special meetings i also am concerned still that it says related to special meetings within 48 hours of advance notice to the public Again, why is an individual council member required to notice to the public versus to the chair? Because um, it doesn't say to the public in that first section here. I just think that something is being lost in drafting or translation here. If the council member's intent was to maintain our current flexibility, I am I am not ne necessarily seeing that in the language in front of us. And I'm not comfortable voting on this version, though I understand better what the intent was from Council Member Herbold at this point. Um, as a director, Handy, I see that you want to chime in here, but I just, I just, um, there's been a couple times, Council Member Mosqueda, where you've referred to current flexibility, and I just um, want to remind you that current flexibility is zero electronic participation, that unless we change the rules. So the only reason we have maximum flexibility to participate electronically is because Governor Inslee issued the proclamation allowing for that to be the case. As soon as that proclamation is rescinded, we will default to the base rules. The base rules are extraordinarily restrictive because they only allow a council member to participate electronically in the enumerated situations that you and I worked on in 2018. And in the base rules, it is currently required that in order to, to participate electronically for what, for a reason that is unrelated to those issues, you have to get consent from the body to be able to participate. And so the amendment before us is trying to change the base rules. So it's really important that we not compare this amendment to, to current operations because current operations are, are in place because of the proclamation the governor issued related to the public health ordinance, which has allowed us to suspend in its entirety the rules related to electronic versus in-person participation. So what we're trying to do here is comparing this amendment to pre-COVID life <laughs> and how the rules were in pre-COVID um, with the expectation that someday we might be back um, in pre-COVID um, um, scenario and wanting to sort of implement a hybrid model is I think what we're trying to achieve and, and in order to achieve a hybrid model that works for everyone um, we need to have some level of um, notification so that IT and chairs of committees and the council president and others can plan for the logistics necessary to accommodate a request for electronic participation. So to the extent that, that the um, request for electronic participation requires approval by the council president, I agree that that's probably too, goes a little too far. Um, but I do think that there needs to be some sort of proactive community. It cannot be in the 11th hour. As council president, I can tell you, there are so many times currently where I will get messages within 30 minutes or 15 minutes of a scheduled meeting about being late, about having some technology issue, about needing to leave early, wanting to change their order, wanting to do this. It is just so hard to manage the efficiency of our meetings without requiring some semblance of a notice. 
And if we want to, um, you know, make sure that 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 you know that people aren't feeling like they're being micromanaged in terms of their discretion as a council member, I agree that we shouldn't we should have language that um, addresses those concerns. But there has to be some level of notice in this world of a hybrid model of how we are going to do our business as a city council um, post post COVID. Um, so I just wanted to add that for some some. Um, you know, context to the conversation because I feel like we're, com we're 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 comparing what it's like now to this amendment, um, and the reality is is that we we should be comparing what's happening, uh, what's what's happening uh, in this amendment to what how we were operating um, pre pre COVID. So, um, Director Handy, did you want to add anything else? I don't have anything specific to add there. Happy to field more questions as they come up. Councilmember Herbold. I just want to flag, I appreciate there's multiple um, places in which this language is inserted. Um, and so I'm looking in one place and there may be an error in another place, but one, I don't believe there's a requirement for approval to, of the president. I believe that uh, the language is to inform the president. And secondly, I don't think there's a requirement to notify the public and there certainly isn't an intent to uh, require notification to the public. Yeah, I, I can clarify that notification of the public language that is um, in the special meeting section. Um, if we can scroll to that just so we're all looking at it. That is in the case when a special meeting has been noticed to the public with less than 48 hours. In those cases, a council member just needs to provide notice to the council president. They don't need to provide 48 hours notice. Those, those sit next to each other. So I, I can understand why that would be confusing. Um, but the notice is about the meeting um, being public, not the notice of the council member's absence being public. Thank you. Well, well, and it's not an absence. It's just electronic thank, participation. Thank you. I, I misspoke there about their electronic participation. Okay. Um, council Member Strauss, did you still want to chime in here? Uh, thank you, Council President. Not specifically about this. It sounds like this has much more work. I do have my second of third community event that I need to attend shortly. And so my time is quickly expiring. Um, in addition to my office hours, I am regularly present with the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman Strauss. How much longer do we have you for so I can move this along here? If I'm gonna have food before this meeting, I have about negative 10 minutes. So um, I can stick with you for about another 20 minutes at most. Um, I won't be able to eat before my event. Okay, so. sounds good. Uh, we will um, we will try to wrap this up in the next 15 minutes. The good news is we only have one more amendment after this and it's yours, Councilmember Strauss. <laughs> um, so um, so colleagues, I, I, do, I do want to um, keep us moving here. May I um, suggest, um, may, May, may I um, suggest that we um, do a little bit more work on this one and just uh, get a little bit more understanding of this amendment um, to make sure that we have, um, you know, sort of greater comfort by the time we get to Monday. Councilmember Herbold, would that be okay with you? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate the conversation we had here. I think it's really important. Um, I think we know where the issues and concerns are, and I think there's a way uh, to make sure that the language is reflective and not confusing. So reflective and clear as to what the intent here is, which is to create a change from the status quo rules, which severely limit electronic participation. Um, uh, to to um, to document some level of flexibility. Now, if there is a desire to have the greatest level of flexibility, such as we do now, um, then you know that would need to be um, a new amendment um, being being proposed because this is more of a middle of the ground approach um, as opposed to a electronic always. Um, proposal, which was one of the recommendations um, being put forward by, or one of the options being put forward by the work group. So, um, so appreciate the uh, need to have a little bit more conversation on this one and make sure we're all on the same page. 
uh, but I believe we will get there. Councilmember Mosqueda? Thank Thanks, you. I agree and I appreciate the, the sponsor's clarification. Um, I also want to apologize to central staff and to my colleagues. I understand now where I was misreading the public um, aspect of the notice to the public. Uh, so apologies for that and appreciate that we can continue to finesse this regarding approval by council members uh, and look forward to that conversation on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And again, the approval part is, um, is um, exists in our in our in our base rules, um, but let's let and and maybe we want to change that. So um, if that's if that's the case, this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity to do it. So um, more to come on that. Um, appreciate the conversation here. Okay, the last amendment. I'm going to move us quickly uh, over to that one. Um, uh, will uh, I'm going to go ahead and move us to Amendment 15. Um, Director Handy, can you uh, walk us through this, please? Yes, um, amendment, excuse me, amendment 15 is our final amendment today. It is sponsored by council member Strauss. This gives me an opportunity to do this better justice than I did at our last committee meeting. Um, amendment 15 would set the council's intent to consider updating the council rules to move to a new session based legislative calendar similar to one that is used in the Washington State Legislature, such that our legislative calendar would be grouped into multiple sessions where there is time for committee work, bills have a cutoff date and move to full council action. <laughs> there's a break, we do that again, there's a special committee um, um, for a special session for budget. Um, if, pa if this amendment passed, the clerk's office and the council rules work group would reconvene in January to explore the best practices and the logistics related to this proposal and um, would have the council consider this change by April 30th, 2022. Great, thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Strauss, I'm gonna hand it over to you to make your motion here. Thanks, I move uh, to amend resolution 32029 uh, as presented in amendment one on the agenda. Second. Uh, amendment, amendment, whatever. 15, 15. 15. Amendment. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt uh, Amendment 15 as presented on the agenda. I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Strauss to make some remarks. Thanks. I'll keep this brief. I am here to request your support for us to, to allow us to continue this work. Uh, for me to take the time to explain, in, in particular, when uh, Mr. Eater and I sat down with uh, Director Handy to discuss all of the different levels that we would have to change our rules in the amount of time that we would have had, uh, it would not have been an appropriate work request to make of either Director Handy or Mr. Eater. And so my request is to allow us more time and set a date certain in which we will return to uh, discuss our council rules regarding a legislative session. The importance of this is to put parameters on our work so that we are more efficiently and effectively able to conduct our work. Uh, right now, we have an ongoing rolling basis for all work, except for and saving for the budget session. What I envision with this is uh, similar to the legislative ses session in Olympia, where you have time set aside for committee, you then have time set aside for floor action. When I look at how that applies to the city council, I could imagine two months of just committee work with sporadic committees of the whole as as needed and then time so if two months of committee work and then a month of of full council work or floor action for us all to be able to understand what is coming out of each other's committees as it stands right now if you're not on the committee you get about one crack at it and you feel pressurized to vote it out in the first moment that you have seen it and so this gets at um I mean, this will also touch on uh, abstentions or illuminating alternates. This gets to, um, yeah, some of these other things as well. So I ask your graciousness to include this in the resolution so that we have more time to work on it and bring you a full proposal. Thank you so much, Councilmember Strauss. Councilmember Herbold, your hand is raised. Please go ahead. And if anyone else has any um, questions or comments, um, invite you to raise your hand as well. Councilmember Herbold. 
Thank you. I just want to thank the sponsor uh, for reworking uh, the proposal before us, um, not only uh, recognizing the complexity um, that it would have in our own rules, but also I think it will be really important to uh, interact um, with all of the executive departments um, on and, and have a full discussion of the um, schedule implications on, um, on on workflow coming from them as well, just to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page and there are no unintended consequences for, so thanks, thank you for putting this forward as a um, an item for further study. Thank you so much, Councilmember Mosqueda. I wanna thank the sponsor. I'm an enthusiastic yes on this. I do wish we had the policy in front of us today. Um, I wish we could do this next year, but we'll be happy, happy to work with you on this. I think that um, as we talked about, there's also some really good ideas about how do we front load policy early in the year and then maybe move to like a floor action session. Happy to work with you on that and really appreciate this amendment and the visionary thinking behind this, um, which, you know, as Council Member Herbal noted, if we move towards this and other departments know that this is our time frame, then I think it would be a pretty easy um, timeline to transition to if we were able to get it all put together. So very happy to support this. Okay, thanks so much. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, not hearing anything else. Uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and close that debate unless Customer Strauss, you have anything else to add? Nothing else to add. All right, we're gonna get we're gonna get you out of here with a little bit extra time to take care of your human needs. Um, okay, here we go. Um, colleagues, uh, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment Fifteen? Mosqueda, aye. Strauss, yes. Chair Gonzalez, abstain. That's uh, two in favor, one abstention. Okay, the motion carries. The amendment is adopted and the amended bill is before the council. Uh, okay, so council members, that's it. That's all the amendments that I'm aware of. So now we're gonna move um, actual uh, passage of resolution 3209. So I now move that the committee recommend passage of resolution 32029 as amended. Is there a second? Yeah. It's been moved and seconded to recommend passage of the resolution. Uh, are there any additional comments? Uh, Madam President, I will just note an interest in Council Member Strauss's amendment number 13. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about the ways to better enforce existing Roberts rules and the 10 minute allotments there. Um, so I'll look forward to talking with Council Member Strauss perhaps uh, between now and Monday um, to make sure that we have a greater clarity on that. But appreciate the work that you and the committee have done to get us to this point here today. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Councilmember Mosqueda. Appreciate it. Any other comments? Uh, final comments on the resolution. All right. Well, I do want to thank you, colleagues, for all your engagement in the council rules revision process. This has been uh, a much more robust uh, process than usual, um, and a lot of work has gone into briefing council members, analyzing proposals, and preparing amendments. And for that, um, I want to thank our office of. Uh, the city clerk, including Monica Martinez Simmons, Elizabeth Atkinson, Jody Schwinn, Linda Barone, uh, Amelia Sanchez, and uh, central staff, including Esther Handy and Dan Eder, the city attorney's office, including Brandon Islib and Gary Smith, and of course, uh, my deputy chief of staff, Cody um, Ryder, for all of their tremendous work on this. We're making a number of proposed changes to the council rules via this resolution. And as always, this is an iterative process. Um, we already know that there's a couple of uh, things we'll have to deal with uh, between now and Monday, but I believe that this um, was a really important body of work and hope that it does make our legislative process more efficient and effective. And I wanna thank you all for your engagement and look forward to um, taking this back up uh, at city council to take final action this coming Monday, December 13th. So that being said, will the clerk call the roll on the committee recommendation that resolution 32029 be passed and forwarded to the full city council on December 13th, 2021. Mosqueda? Aye. Strauss? Yes. Chair Gonzalez? Aye. That's three in favor. 
Thank you so much. Uh, the motion passes and the committee will uh, forward resolution 32029 to the full city council for passage. Okay, um, we are at the part of adjournment. Is there any further business to come before the committee? Hearing no further Matt, business. Oh, Madam Council President, if this is your last committee meeting, just want to say thank you to you and your team for all that you've done through your committee. Appreciate you. Thank you. It is, in fact, my very last uh, committee that I'm chairing, but not my last committee. <laughs> that will be actually Councilmember Peterson's um, committee next week. So, um, so thank you, everybody, for your participation and your robust engagement in in this. Um, I know it was in the weeds, and we are way over time. But I really do deeply appreciate. Um, um you taking the time so okay well here you know for their business that does conclude our last governance and education committee meeting for 2021 and my last uh chair of a of a, a subject matter um committee meeting so thanks to all of you for your hard work over the last couple of years we're adjourned <laughs>